Welcome back. Uh, my name is Stefan. I go by Murmurs Online, dedicated exclusively to Demir Shadow. Super exciting video for you guys. I was able to jump into a challenge, not something I'm able to do very often given my weekends are pretty booked up. Uh, so when I can find the time to do it, always happy to be able to try. And this time it was a great success. Uh, walked away with the trophy here and, and won the entire challenge. It was a 79 person challenge. So a bit of a spoiler, obviously, to start off. But um, if you're someone who pays attention to the modern metagame and you know, keeping up to all the different challenge results, uh, you'll have already known that this is something that I did. So I was super stoked to be able to get a great result with um, Demir Shadow. I think it's a list or a deck that people typically write off as maybe just being a lesser uh, version of um, is it Murktide or just really not capable of putting up good results consistently. Well, I get where people are coming from. I think it's a list, no matter what, that you can dedicate time to and get better with, and it will treat you well. It has a lot of good answers. Still some massive threats that can end games. So I'm um, looking forward to walking through all of this with you guys, but we'll jump right into it. It's going to be a long video. Uh, just really want to take some time, first and foremost, though, to appreciate you know, all the love everyone's given me, up to 99 subscribers already um, in the first three videos, two videos, really. Um, since starting the channel. So super stoked about that. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to come in, support me, share kind words. This is time consuming endeavor for me, but I love being able to do it. And I'm super happy that it's able to help you guys out. Um, okay, so let's take a quick look and comparison before we jump into the actual league play, the list changes with the ban of violent outbursts that happened. Uh, so I dropped two Archmage's Charms. They were a little bit too mana intensive. While I liked them for card draw and the versatility, I wanted to change it up. I wanted to remove as much three mana liability as possible, especially with the amount of three mana spells in the sideboard. Um, so taking two Archmage's Charms out, uh, taking a dress down that was in the sideboard, bringing it back into the main like I had had quite a while ago. Um, Praise and Borrower still in the in the list. Nice to be able to bounce some stuff. Uh, Dark Slick Shores still a one of as as a land. Still love that. Haven't changed my opinion on that. Would highly recommend it. Uh, I did bring in an Undercity Sewers, which is the new uh, dual land that is both an island and a swamp. Um, a lot of people have been testing it. Obviously, a lot of different modern lists have been playing versions of the Survey lands. So uh, I think it's been a good addition. This was really my first time actually trying it, and I was overall pretty happy with it. There is some times where maybe you get stuck with a hand that normally would have been keepable, but now you've got a, a tap land that, of course, does survey, but you're stuck on one land and hopefully trying to hit that second one. There are times where it's not a great option to have, but I think by increasing the land count to 19, like I've done here, uh, and, and having the option to be able to fetch it out late games to help kind of ensure that you don't flood out or draw something that's completely irrelevant, it's a nice addition. So I've liked it, uh, and I would also recommend trying it out if you're looking to get into the list. Um, other than that, just specifically for this particular challenge, uh, I had seen that Sundays, for whatever reason, Tron typically sees a bit of an uptick. I guess maybe it's just the time zone and the type of players it attracts during that time. I'm not 100% sure. So Break the Ice comes in as a two of, really good against Tron. Um, dropped Fluster Storms and Chalice of the Voids with basically not all of, but most of the issues um, or concerns with uh, Cascade focused decks more or less out of my mind. Um, I still think I can fight those decks relatively well with what I have here anyway. So uh, happy to just drop those and kind of bring in some things that will help fight some of the more prevalent uh, decks that are currently in the formats. Uh, dom uh, domain is, is still top of mind. So that's the reason there's three hibernations here. Um, I think three is excessive. I wanted to just try it, uh, but I would be going back down to two moving forward and probably adding a third break the ice if I'm anticipating being in a lot of a uh, Tron heavy type of meta. I think Tron's a deck that constantly rises back up to the top whenever there's bands or people are still trying to reef kind of determine what the the structure of the format is going to be in terms of what's good uh so i would kind of hedge against tron with with a third break the ice over um three hibernations moving forward but for this i still had it i don't think i ran into domain once throughout the entire tournament but anyway uh, that's what it's there for shoulders edict another good domain hate type of card um it's also just good against a wide variety of decks and that's pretty much all of the changes so we can jump right into it moving forward from here and get into the gameplay looking forward to walking through it first round first match um up against uh the tutina um honestly i keep this hand just taking a look at it here i would never recommend anyone keeps this but i was actively in the process of doing a league match while I was waiting for this tournament to start. So I kind of, I don't know, just didn't see what exactly I had. Saw keep thinking that I had a second land. I didn't. So never, ever, ever keep this hand if you have it. Um, 
but unfortunately in my case, I'm going to start off this, this entire challenge with a, a very, very bad hand. Luckily we've got at least a spot C's that we can start off on to try and um, keep my opponent at bay. Um, go from there. So that's what we're going to do. Um, lead on a thought C's and find out that we're up against Tron. Their hand is two Tron lands and then a third power plant or a second power plant. So they don't have Tron online, but they do have ways to get there. Uh, so for me, game plan is definitely to remove the chromatic star and just really hope that I'm able to either counter their Sylvan scryings or they just don't get to the ability to, to cast them because they don't have green mana available to it, right? So in Tron or when you're playing against Tron, um, obviously leading on a Thought Seize is going to be extremely valuable because it allows you to determine what you need to do and what you need to attack or let go to try and put yourself in the best position to win the game. And in my case, this potential scenario, this particular scenario is to keep them off green mana and try to keep them off Tron, force them to draw Tron naturally instead of tutoring up for it. All right. So play it out from here. Um, my opponent's just going to play their power plant, new about, send it back. I'm not going to really have anything for the next turn, miss my land drop. I do find it here, so I'm going to have access to counterspell. Luckily, going to be able to counterspell whatever they try and do on their third turn. They find a forest. Sylvan Scrying is going to get countered. They're going to have another one for next turn, so problematic, but luckily I'm <laughs> counterspell off the top. Super fortunate. Um, so I'm going to counterspell this next Sylvan Scrying that comes. It's putting myself in a pretty good position. They're going to play out the power plant that we knew about and pass it back to me. Uh, I, at this point, have to hold up Orcish Bowmasters and just have it go underneath the uh, one ring that I knew about from the start of the game. Just going to ping them and have them, of course, be able to draw a couple of cards or a card uh, and just ping myself to kind of continue to grow this army token. They're also going to play out a relic, which is going to more or less shut down uh, my ability to play out a Merc Tide for the rest of the game. I've got two in hand. So, yeah, that, that starting hand has been just absolutely miserable, but I'm kind of lucky that my opponent at this point is also not really doing anything too crazy. Um, obviously, they've got a lot of opportunity to draw into that uh, third Tron land and get an insane amount of mana and also just start to fuel their hand with a lot of card draw. Drawing the second Orcish Bow Master, though, is really going to be extremely advantageous um, as it's just going to really apply a lot of pressure to my opponents. So I can't attack in here, obviously, as they have protection from everything. It's just this useless attack. Uh, they are going to activate this ring, which I am going to then get under with Orcish Bow Master and start to ping them down. For quite a bit of damage, four triggers at them, uh, growing the Orc Army. So I'm very happy with that. They are going to still not hit that Tron land they need. So very happy that I was able to counter two Sylvan Scryings. Going to have six mana for a Warm Coil Engine, which is going to get bounced by the Brazen Borrower. Uh, so I'm able to attack in for nine here, uh, essentially putting them down to four. They can't draw off their One Ring, uh, otherwise they're just dead. So in this case, they do have to just play out a second One Ring to protect themselves for a turn. They're going to activate it, and for me. Um, I do want to be a little bit cautious of not dying to just a massive walking ballista if they do hit that third Tron land. So I do ping myself, uh, but I also ping the Orc Army token uh, just to make sure that I'm not putting myself in a spot where I'm dying to that massive walking ballista by complete accident. I've got a Ferocious Stubborn Denial. I've got Drown the Lock. Feeling pretty good about where I'm at here. They go for uh, an Oblivion Stone after being able to tutor up their, uh, their third Tron land finally off that Urza Saga in the map. And they will concede to the Stubborn Denial, as they don't have a way of dealing with what I've got on board, and they're just going to die to their own One Ring, even if they do. So, um, yeah, super happy with that game. Obviously a terrible, terrible keep. Um, just got uh, realistically pretty lucky with the second Orcish Bowmaster, um, drawing a second counter spell, being able to hit my land drop in a timely fashion to enable the ability to interact with those Sylvan Scryings. Obviously my opponent got a bit lucky as well to be able to hit a Forest to be able to cast them, but... For a Tron deck, I feel like they got kind of unlucky, uh, while I got generally pretty lucky for how bad of a hand I kept. So we'll take it uh, and, and go on to game number two. Here we are back for game number two. Sideboarding for Tron, relatively straightforward. Uh, all of the terrible removal, Fatal Pushes, Dismembers coming out, bringing in Tashana Sidebinders, um, Break the Ice, obviously exceptional. The whole reason it's in the deck is for Tron. Uh, and then um, Children's Edict is good. It's not... Great. Uh, it can obviously answer planeswalkers. It can answer their larger creatures that are problematic, even though those problematic creatures typically just take over the game anyway. Uh, but I'd rather have those six cards over fatal pushes and dismembers. So that is the takes and, and the inserts. Um, opening hand here, pretty mediocre again. I am going to keep this under the assumption that because I have four lands 
and a consider and a fetch land, I'm going to be able to basically get most of the lands out of my deck, or at least reduce the chance of finding more lands, uh, and hopefully just hit the gas that I need to be able to power through a Tron matchup. Um, yeah, I can definitely see why people would maybe, you know, say, ship this or send it back. I can agree with that to some degree, but already kind of at a disadvantage being on the draw against Tron anyway. Um, I'd rather hope that I can find what I need off of considers and have the mana available to me than mulligan to six or mulligan to five, trying to find the perfect cards that are going to potentially force a win by interacting extremely heavily with my opponent. Okay, so um, opponent is going to just play out a, a, a sphere and ship it back to me. Uh, I'm going to lead on a shock and send it back to them. They're going to have Sylvan Scrying off of that green mana. So they've got Tron online for next turn. I'm going to consider, find a counter spell, be able to interact with whatever it is they try and uh, put on the battlefield this turn. In this case, it's going to be a card the Great Creator that is going to get counterspelled, and they are just going to spend three mana on filling their entire board with a bunch of one mana artifacts. So a star, a sphere, and an expedition map. Um, only two cards in hand. Find a shock, point to shock, and bottom a... Uh, a land to keep the, the counter spell on top. Um, they are going to draw off the chromatic sphere and star uh, and then go for an oblivion stone. Um, could have got the orcish boat master underneath that to you know, try to start pinging away at them a little bit and apply some pressure, but I want to be able to more than likely and try and answer whatever big thing they try and get down instead of, um, you know, trying to force through an orcish bow master. So uh, in this case, was able to counter an Oblivion Stone, and they weren't able to double spell, which is extremely fortunate for me as well. Um, you can see that. Moving over to me, going to play out the Death Shadow to try and start applying some pressure and basically just hold up um, an Orcish Bowmaster or a Dress Down. Um, this Dress Down definitely going to be pretty valuable in time as they have an Urza Saga in play, assuming that they're going to want to uh, activate it and start to grow a board of Karnstrucks. Going to get this Orcish Bowmaster underneath the one ring that they've gone out and played. Nothing I can really do about it other than just try and be aggressive. Uh, I am going to ping down my life total to grow my Death Shadow uh, to do a 5 5 at this point so it can kind of at least interact with any constructs they might try and swing at me into the future. Draw another Death Shadow. Really good here, but at the same time, obviously my board is extremely susceptible to getting wiped by any of the board wipes that they have access to. They're going to create another construct here. Perfectly fine to see that. Uh, they're going to draw. I'm going to ping them down for two. And they're going to cast a... Um, they're going to end up casting a Karn the Great Creator, which can't really do anything about it. Um, and in this case, they do go for an Engineered Explosives. Uh, I did look into their sideboard after all the lists were posted. And they do have access to Incinerary Bridge, like pretty much every Karn sideboard does. Uh, I do think it was probably the better call for them to go for the the ensnaring bridge, especially because they're going to play out enough cards as we continue through this turn to be able to get their hand size down to four, which would um, basically make it so that it can't swing in with any of my creatures other than the Orcish Bowmaster. Uh, so get a bit lucky to some degree that they go for the um, engineered explosives here. And yes, of course, I do lose my Death Shadows. It does suck. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'd much rather take that and be able to swing in with a 7-7 and a 1-1 one, one and be able to remove their Karn Structs from the board while also being able to take down their um, their Karn the Great Creator next turn over just not being able to swing at them at all and uh, having them kind of take over the game with Karn the Great Creator. So dress down at end step to basically be able to wipe away their board and also have the full um, six mana available to me for next turn instead of you know, just holding on to dress down. Uh, and, and having to cast it in my own turn and then only have four mana available to me. That worked out exceptionally well. I've got Break the Ice that can be overloaded, um, costing a total of six mana to essentially wipe out their entire mana base uh, and leave them with essentially nothing, right? They're not really going to be able to rebuild, at least not quick enough to uh, deal with what I have on board. Uh, if I just swing at their Karn and take it down to one, um, or I can you know, just remove it from the board altogether if I really felt like it. I can basically just leave them with a one ring in play and then you know a relic, and potentially they're able to get that expedition map to crack in a couple of turns and a, you know, build back. But with the board state that I have, it just almost virtually impossible from for them to win with no mana in play. Uh, but I've drawn a Merktide Regent. They see that they have a relic of Progenitus in play, 
And I get kind of just blinded to the fact that I want to get the Murktide region out. Otherwise, I'm just not going to get the opportunity to do it. Um, like I've said, I think in my very first video, like I do have a tendency to just get very tunnel visioned by a particular line. And unfortunately, me drawing the Murktide region immediately went to, oh no, I need to get this Murktide region out or it's just going to be stranded in my hand indefinitely. But there is a dress down in play. So that means that when I do exile cards from my graveyard, they have to be, or ideally, I should make them uh, non-instant, non-sorcery cards because it's just no matter what going to come down as a 3-3 due to the dress down. Um, however, if they do crack the Relic of Progenitus, it's going to exile all of the creature, all of the cards from my graveyard, which will then grow the Murktide region. So what I'm doing here is I'm paying four mana, um, and I guess I'll just start to click through it here. I'm paying four mana to exile uh, some non-relevant cards, um, plus the four mana to cast this Murktide Regent. I'm going to break the ice on uh, their Urza's Mine, basically leaving them with four lands in play, but they do have access to Expedition Map. Expedition map on their turn would allow them to basically crack the expedition map and still have access to eight mana, right? Two towers plus the mine that they go get if they want to take that approach. They could obviously also just naturally draw into the mine as well and have a lot more mana than that. But basically, what I'm trying to get to is this line that I took was garbage. Uh, I got super tunnel visioned. It wasn't good. This game could have just been over had I overloaded the break the ice. No idea why I didn't do it. As soon as I cast the Murktide Regents, I immediately realized that it was the worst play I could have made, um, but it is what it is. We move on, and we just kind of have to hope that my opponent essentially bricks, because having access to seven mana is, or eight mana, I should say, is basically an insane amount of different board wipes that they have access to, right? Relic of Progenitus, or excuse me, uh, Oblivion Stone plus a crack is eight mana. Um, a uh, Ugin down tick can remove my entire board. Just so many different things that can absolutely destroy me, and they just take over the game. They've got a one ring in play. Uh, they've got Karn, which I swing at, you know, taking it down to one life. Um, but at the end of the day, they just have so much access to ways to deal with my board that it made absolutely no sense to take the line that I took. I get extremely lucky that my opponent draws all the way up to eight cards in hand and still is unable to deal with my board state, and I'm able to get the win. So avoid a disaster. Please, if you're picking up the deck, and this opportunity obviously comes to you, uh, learn from this terrible mistake that I got extremely fortunate on, and just overload the break the ice. Destroy their lands, end the game. Would have been very simple. Uh, I made this more complicated than it had to be. Back for match number two. Opening hand is above average. Certainly could be maybe a little bit weaker to decks that have to be highly interactive with. Um, but overall, chance to kind of get out two shadows that can sneak in for, what, 26 damage if for whatever reason that opportunity prevents itself. Consider can help me find maybe what I might need to to interact in the appropriate way with the matchup based off of what my opponent leads on. Um, certainly need to find another fetch land or some way to lower my loaf total a little bit more. But on the draw, I'm, I'm happy to kind of keep this and see how things play out. Obviously, if my opponent's on like a Ragavan deck or something, this might get a little bit problematic. but. We'll, we'll take that. Uh, opponent's going to lead on an Urza Saga, doing nothing else to me. The signals that they are on basically Amulet Titan. I don't know any other deck that would maybe make this lead play, at least keeping a hand like this. Um, they do go for a Explore, and then they're going to copy their uh, with Vesufa to make a second Urza Saga. So at this point, they have access to basically a lot of constructs if they wanted it. They have access to go get multiple Amulet Titans in a few or Amulet of Acres in a few turns, or, you know, a, a map and an amulet you know, they're definitely on their way to building into a big combo turn with a titan so need to be able to find a way to interact effectively um i'm going to consider i'm going to find a preordain here i want to keep that preordain to be able to filter a little bit deeper into my deck for turns uh three onwards I'm going to hold up a drown the lock here in case it ends up being relevant for like a summoner's pact or something like that um can also hold up of course dress down if for whatever reason they were able to combo off in that turn somehow um but they're going to play out a Dryad of the Elysian Grove, make a construct, send it back over to me. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to fetch and shock to lower my life total and go back to my turn. Um, finding a consider off the draw, going to fetch and shock, play out one Death Shadow and hold up Dress Down to interact with whatever I need to if they're going to go for a Titan. Uh, they are going to make another construct instead, so very happy to have this Dress Down here. Great card in the matchup overall. Um, brings a lot of value on both sides of the uh, the table. Um, 
so yeah, they're going to make their current struct. They are going to go for an expedition map. Um, and in this instance right here, I do have the opportunity to drown the dryad of the Elysian Grove so they don't get another land drop. Um, but I'm kind of thinking that they're going to go for a, uh, a Teleria West, and I'm going to have to use this Drown the Lock to drown the Teleria West. Uh, so instead of trying to reduce the value they might get off of this Dryad of the Elysian Grove, I'm expecting to use the Drown the Lock for a later turn. Um, instead, they're going to go get a Cavern of Souls, basically to make sure that I can't counter their stuff. Uh, so not the end of the world. Um, I'm, I'm going to basically have to go uh, kill this Dryad of the Elysian Grove in their end step. And technically, had I played more aggressively, put out to Death Shadow, two Death Shadows last turn, um, I would have been able to win this game on my next turn. But it's likely that my opponent actually had the ability to get it to tighten out uh, in, in this turn here, this their fourth turn, and they played around a counterspell. Um, so I don't think I would have actually got the win. I probably would have just died to the combo had I played a little bit more aggressively. Um, in this instance, I'm a little too fast here, but preordain trying to find a Thoughtseize, assuming that my opponent definitely has a Titan in hand at this point, given that they took the line that they did last turn. Don't find it. I found a Counterspell and uh, a land of fetch land. So I'm going to bottom both. I end up drawing this Orcish Bowmaster. I'm going to get out my other Death Shadow as a 2-2, ship it back to them, hold up Dress Down to be able to stop the trigger on the Titan that I'm assuming is going to be coming, and then also clear their board, which is exactly what ends up happening. Um, so overall fine with it, but certainly need to be able to find a way to deal with the Titan that is now on the battlefield. Um, off this Dress Down, I'm also going to draw Thoughtseize, which is great. I can start to increase the uh, size of my shadows while also um, having the ability to kind of protect my life total a little bit with some larger shadows being able to get in front of that uh, that uh, Titan if if they decide to swing in. Um, again, sorry, I went a little bit too fast here, but I consider trying to find a Drown the Lock, knowing that Drown the Lock would kill their Titan after I thought sees, um, putting them at exactly six cards in the graveyard. I don't find a Drown the Lock. Uh, I do bin the Orcish Bowmaster that was on top, uh, and instead I've hit this Murktide region, which is now in my hand. Um, so I'm going to cast a Thought Seize. I see they've got Grazer, Summoner's Pact, the One Ring. Um, I do want to take either the One Ring or the Summoner's Pact. I mean, in this case, it doesn't really matter because I've got a Stubborn Denial that I'm going to be able to hold up after playing at the Murktide region as an 8-8. So I can counter either one of those big threats, but I'm going to take the Stubborn, uh, excuse me, the Summoner's Pact um, to force them to have to tap more mana in their turn if they want to run out the one ring. Um, so I'm down to nine life. I've got two four four shadows and eight eight Murktide Regent, passing it back to them with not too much, so as long as they don't, you know, draw absolute fire from here. Um, I think I'm in an okay spot. They go for their one ring. I'm gonna stub that. They're gonna swing in with the Titan. I'm apparently willing to get rid of it to one of my creatures, or I guess probably my Murktide Regent, which is what I'm going to block with here as what they go and get, which is a Valakut and a Teleria West basically tells me that they're going to tutor up uh, another Summoner's Pact and then go for a Dryad of the Elysian Grove, which would actually put me to exactly dead if I don't block here. So I'm going to block with the Murktide Regent, um, take out the Titan, and they are going to do exactly what I expected, which is tutor up that uh, Dryad and play it out. Um, uh, at some point, they're basically just going to be left with a uh, Boreal Grazer in hand, and of course that trigger does remove my Murktide Regent from the battlefield. So Feeling okay. Uh, I do draw a Thought Seize here, which is generally going to be fantastic at making sure that they can't do any weird shenanigans with extra land drops or insane amount of land drops. I do not want to lower my life total below six as um, a bounce land would kill me uh, with the two land drops they can make from the Dryad of the Elysian Grove and the triggers. So at this point, I am going to swing in for 12 because I want to play aggressively. They're definitely not blocking this. Uh, and I do have a Bowmaster to protect myself on the crackback. So uh, not too concerned about that. Of course, they do have a couple of draws. That would be able to kill me, no question about it. How much I can do about it, I do have to play aggressively, close this game out. They swing in. They kind of make a bit of a weird sequencing call here where they activate um, this uh, stone, is it stone home, sun home, fortress, or whatever the hell it's called, um, before going to blocks. So, I mean, they just kind of tap out, showing me they've got nothing. doesn't really matter too much, but I mean, if they had something else that could have been played on their second main, um, they certainly shouldn't have, have played the way they did. Either way, game's over and uh, going on to match number two. Back for game number two against Titan on the draw. Um, taking a quick look at sideboarding, two stubs are coming out, two fatal push or four fatal push. 
one Drown the Lock, one Preordain, and then bringing in two Hibernations, two Shoulders Edicts, two Dishana Sidebinders, and two Engineered Explosives. So Engineered Explosives can deal more often than not just with their um, Amulet of Vigors, but there are times where it can take out you know, a board of Connor Instructs or something like that, if that is the line they end up going with or the hand they try to keep. Um, Dishana Sidebinder, very versatile against pretty much all the different triggers that they have and actually shutting things down indefinitely unless they can remove it off the board. Uh, Shoulders Edict is just the best uh, removal available in the matchup, and the reason why I drop all four of my Fatal Pushes is because I don't want to have just a card stuck in hand anticipating that they're going to play a dry out of the Elysian Grove when sometimes you know they can just win without it altogether. Um, so I'd rather not just have Fatal Push stuck in hand when I can kind of bring something else a little bit more versatile in. Um, Hibernation maybe a bit more questionable, um, but I've been testing it a bit just to get a sense of how I can play it in this matchup and if it's good enough. Uh, on the draw, definitely a little iffy. On the play, a lot more reasonable, but nonetheless, um, the reason I bring it in is simply there are times where you can kind of get into this stalled board state where they just have Boreal Grazers, dry of the Elysian Groves and whatnot, just kind of clogging up the board, and you've got maybe a couple of big Death Shadows that can't actually swing through for lethal because of it, so by bouncing their entire board back while keeping yours, you can swing for an Alpha Strike and win the game. Or sometimes they overcommit to the combo and leave themselves vulnerable to losing to a Summoner's Pact trigger um, if they get stuck on land and kind of go for a hyper amulet of vigor, hyper bounce land heavy type of hand. Um, so again, just kind of testing it. I wouldn't say it's 100% the best thing to do, but that's kind of the reasoning why I'm, I'm approaching it this way and I'll continue to explore it moving forward. Um, but yeah, this hand on the draw, not good enough whatsoever. So I'm going to ship that back. Uh, my six is definitely a lot better. I'm going to be placing the consider back into the deck. And leading with Thoughtseize holding up Counterspell and then having Deshaun's Tidebinder on turn three, I don't want to be putting a land back into the deck and potentially missing out on the opportunity to have Deshaun's Tidebinder on curve, given how versatile and good it is uh, against what they try to do typically. So that is the play here. Um, they are going to lead on an Amulet of Vigor, pass it back to me. I am going to Thoughtseize them and see that they have a hand of uh, a Bounce Land, a Valakut, and one ring, and a Primeval Titan. I'm taking the prime time here because there is obviously the opportunity for them to get a Cavern of Souls either just off the top of their deck or maybe later on over the next couple of turns they're able to go um, tutor for one. So I want to make sure that I'm able to have a counter spell that is guaranteed to resolve against something, then potentially missing out on that opportunity by not having taken the Titan here. So Titan, while it is a later turn play, is the thing that I take on the, the first turn here, leaving them with kind of not much, but obviously they can draw some pretty good stuff. They are going to put up the Valakut and actually cast and explore that they drew for turn. The Simic Growth Chamber is going to come out, and they are going to bounce both Seiju back to their hand, uh, ship it back to me. I get a Drown the Lock, which is pretty mediocre, um, holding up Counterspell for what's assumed to be one ring, but they don't play it out here. I guess they assume I've got a Counterspell and don't want to just jam. Consider. That's fine. Uh, they are going to put out a Dryad of the Elysian Grove here, and I choose to counter this, and in hindsight, I think. It makes more sense to have just waited and maybe used the Shoulders Edict on the Dryad of the Elysian Grove if they do nothing else. Because um, realistically, the Dryad resolves, let's say they have a bounce land, they get two drops, two land drops, because they haven't played a land yet. They maybe go to cast that one ring. I can still counter the one ring and then have Shoulders Edict for the Dryad next turn. Or I guess at that point, I can actually just drown the Dryad of the Elysian Grove if that's the play they take. So. I think I make a mistake here, um, and just because I want to cast Counterspell, I guess, I decide to do it, but in hindsight, I just think it's not the right play, and this potentially is one of the reasons why I'm going to actually lose this game. A little bit of a spoiler alert there, but it is what it is. Um, so consider finding, a yes, a tap land in this instance, but I do want to be able to have uh, multiple spells available to me in a turn in the coming uh, turns, so I, I do want to make sure that I'm hitting my land drops, so I take that, um, and I do draw an Ottawa out, which is fine. Not great, but fine. Um, the One Ring's going to come out, and I am going to actually throw the Tide Binder in front of this trigger instead of letting them try to draw a card and then throw it in front of it to stop the, the card draw. Uh, again, potentially another misplay here. It's hard to say for sure, depending on what they kind of drew off of this One Ring, but I basically didn't want to get into a scenario where we kind of play the game of they don't activate it, and then I'm stuck just holding it to Shauna's Tidebinder and kind of having to play around with my mana a bit and not really knowing what's going to happen. So um, I let them draw one card, 
and then I'm able to start swinging in and you know at least chip away at their life total here, hoping that they just don't really hit anything. Again, is it the right play? I'm not 100% sure. It really depends on what they drew there. But given that you know they did play out a defense grid, um, let me see if there's anything else in the battlefield that I knew about. No. So hard to say exactly how it all played out, but I can almost assume at this point by allowing them to hit that draw, I put myself into a pretty crappy scenario. Um, probably should have just waited. Oh, well, is what it is. Like I said, going to lose this match uh, or this game. And uh, there's a couple of things looking back on it that might have caused that. Defense grid, definitely problematic, and now they're able to copy this defense grid, so I am going to throw out the Orcish Bowmaster while I still have an opportunity to do so. At this point, Drown the Lock is never going to be able to counter anything on the stack because I'm going to have to pay six extra generic mana generic mana to do that, um, which is never going to happen in a Shadow deck. So uh, just trying to sneak some creatures onto the board while I can, and hopefully I'm able to get there, but they've got a Enter's a Saga, um, and they're going to just be able to make some constructs and just really kind of take things from here. Another Mycosynth Gardens is going to allow them to copy an Amulet of Vigor and really start to get aggressive um, should they find what they need to go get a, a Titan. And I mean, with the uh, the Urza Saga that they have, I mean, a map will let them go tutor things up. And really at this point, it's just problematic. Another Urza Saga, yeah, it's it's just bad news. Still trying to be aggressive as much as I can though, um, but the fact that I can't interact whatsoever on their turn uh, means that this game is is definitely wrapped up. They're going to go get that Titan, and I can't do anything about it. If I was able to cast this Hibernation, then of course could be in a very uh, different scenario. I mean, I certainly don't know if it would be winning me the match, but would be in a, at least a different place depending on how they decided to play out their Titan turn. Um, anyway, is what it is. I'll let this play out, but realistically, there's a couple of decisions that I made that I think looking back on it, I'm not saying that they could have won me the game had I played them differently. Um, but you know, every card that you let someone get deeper into the deck can always be the difference between winning and losing. So it'd be interesting to see what my opponent actually drew into and how their side of the field looked because of the decisions that I took. But uh, anyway, is what it is. We'll move on to game number three. Back for game number three against Titan on the play this time. Um, just a quick sideboard update. I'm dropping two counter spells. Everything else stays the same from the last. But I'm bringing uh, two Break the Ice in over these two counter spells. Um, reasoning for this is on the play, Break the Ice is actually a relatively okay card against Titan. A lot of their best hands rely on a land that can produce um, generic mana. So Mycosynth Gardens and Urza Saga, they typically rely on those in their opening hands to be able to kind of really generate what they need to to combo off or build up a board state where they can win. Um, so on the play, because it can be very effective at destroying those, I want to have Break the Ice in this matchup, Counterspell being a card that sometimes can just end up being not good enough because they have uncounterable spells or um, just doesn't end up being exactly what you need. Those are the two that I choose to take out in this instance on the play. Uh, so that's the only adjustments. Everything else stays the same, and the reasoning for those adjustments. Um, opening hand, very good. Thought seems to be able to kind of deal with whatever it is that my opponent is going to be trying to do. Uh, counterspell for a second turn, follow-up play, engineer explosives to remove uh, aim motive vigors off the battlefield, orcish bow masters to start chipping away at their life total and applying pressure, and then hopefully being able to get a death shadow down relatively quickly as well. I mean, at this point, I've got uh, the ability to have my life total down to 12 on my second turn if I really wanted to throw out a 1-1 one, one death shadow on turn two. So... We'll see how things play out, but definitely a hand that I'm going to be keeping 100% of the time on the play against uh, against Titan. My opponent at this point has Mulligan down to five cards, so having a Thoughtseize here, all the better. Uh, going to lead on this Thoughtseize, see what they're working with, and figure out a game plan. Very similar uh, opening hand to their last hand. Um, obviously slightly different, but similar decision-making here. I want this Primeval Titan gone so that I can actually counter this one ring um, should I need to coming turns. So <clears throat> sending it back to them, uh, they're just going to play up this uh, Urza Saga. So as I said, reason why I bring in uh, Break the Ice in the first place is exactly for this reason, right? If I did have a Break the Ice in my hand, that Urza Saga is gone, and they're left with a Bounce Land and a Boseju, and then a One Ring. So it, it would slow them down tremendously. Obviously, I don't have one here, but on the play, because you're able to kind of get ahead of them, it's 100% a, a card that I want to be exploring in the... Uh, in the board or in the in the main deck um, post board, I'm going to pass it back to them. I've got consider if I need it. Uh, 
likely just going to be putting an Orcish Bowmaster into play to start chipping away at their life total. They're going to play out the Bosage that I knew about, pass it back to me. So, yep, Bowmaster's coming down. Ping them, start swinging in. I'm going to draw a Consider for turn and pass it back to them, holding up Counterspell. Uh, don't need to be worrying about getting an Engineered Explosives out yet, uh, simply because next turn, if I'm able to find a land, or yeah, find a land, um, that would allow me to wipe away the Amulet of Bigger that they're definitely going to be getting here, which they do. Um, they put out a tap land, going to try and play the One Ring that I know about, which is going to get countered. So, uh, feeling like I'm in an okay spot. They've got both Sage One Hand and three Unknowns. I do draw the land for turn, so going to Fetch Shock, wipe away this Amulet of Vigor, uh, and swing in for two. And I've now got a Death Shadow that can come down as a 4-4, four, four, probably going to grow quite quick with Considers to grow some, or find some other Shock lands. They choose to Bajookabog themselves. Um, I guess they didn't want to get drowned in the locked or anything like that. That's fine. I think that's an okay play. Um, you know, throwing out this Grazer to get in front of some stuff, slowing me down a little bit, but definitely feeling like I'm in an okay spot. Um, gonna find a land on top. There's an argument to keeping this just for extra life loss, but at this point, I do have a watery grave, my last watery grave in hand. Um, so I can't fetch in shock. I can, you know, fetch for uh, an underground sewers or whatever it is that survey land. Um, but at this point, I want to be drawing interaction or something that's going to be just a lot more relevant than a land um so throwing that into my graveyard another consider going to shock in putting myself down to seven consider again just trying to find something relevant uh, under city sewers is going to be going into my graveyard and i do find a murktide regent so going to swing in for two here they're obviously going to block one of it and then i am going to put out my murktide regent so that they are not able to bounce the bajuka bog and then kind of play it again if that opportunity does present itself. So I want to get this Merc tied out while I can um, and hopefully continue to take over the match from here. Um, obviously, the Boreal Grazer does have reach, so my Merc Tide Regent can get blocked for a turn, uh, but that's not the end of the world. Uh, drawing a second Merc Tide Regent, not terrible considering that I can cast it. I'm uh, going to consider first, trying to see what I can hit. Drown the lock, um, given that they have no cards in their graveyard. Uh, definitely don't want that, so I'm going to put that into my graveyard myself. Um, and I am going to preordain, trying to find again one interaction, just figuring out how I want to be able to approach what might happen. They are a land away from being able to cast a Titan. So ideally, I'd want to have a counter spell or potentially a Thoughtseize, assuming that they have one in hand if they do. Um, Death Shadow Dismember, I do want to keep both of these on top, putting the Dismember into hand. Uh, that will allow me to get a Death Shadow out, um, have Dismember to shrink a creature if I need to. There's no need to be aggressive here and dismember the Boreal Grazer. I'm just going to swing in, let them block, um, because realistically, next turn, the game will be over if they're not able to do anything. So play out my Death Shadow and go to them. They cast a Summoner's Pact, get a dry out of the Elysian Grove, and then give up. So um, overall, pretty happy with that. Definitely some plays in the second game that were a little bit questionable, maybe. Um, really, the first two matches of this entire challenge uh, had a bit of rust, not not the tightest play, but I think that continues to improve as I continue to go into the uh, the rest of the challenge. Overall, very happy with beating Titan. I feel like Titan for the Mirror Shadow is a pretty favorable matchup. Got a lot of ways to interact with them meaningfully. Um, and as long as you're picking your lines properly, more often than not, you should be able to win these matches, um, especially because Amulet Titan has really kind of gotten into like a turn three, turn four type of deck consistently instead of one that tries to get a turn two win, um, you know, here and there. So, uh, yeah, we we can we can definitely keep up to them when they're not building the deck that way. All right, on to match number three. Match number three, we are up against Jengitha deck, uh, presumed to be domain. More often than not, that's going to be the case. Of course, there are some other matchups up there that are going to have. Um, a companion that is Jengitha, but I'm going into this assuming that that's a domain. This hand is absolutely garbage, can't keep it, no lands. So we're gonna send it back, hoping for some better. Um, the mulligan, not a whole hell of a lot better, but it is at least functional. <clears throat> Hopefully I'm able to find a second land and start to really take control of the game with the rest of the cards that I have. I'm really gonna lean on this consider to get the job done, throw the John the Lock back um, under the assumption that I am against Domain and John the Lock is typically just a brutal, terrible card, given most of their big spells that impact me and the board uh, are well above the converted mana cost for me to be able to interact with it more often than not. My opponent is going to be on a multi six. Um, so I'm going to just kind of hold up. Consider with this member available to me, they are going to play out a Ragavan. 
And in my end step, I go for a consider, hopefully trying to find a land, find a fatal push instead, which I am going to put to um, the graveyard. I mean, I need to find a land as much as fatal push is a good card here. I can't cast it, really need to dig. So <clears throat> goes to the graveyard and I still don't have my land drop. Um, going to have to dismember this Ragavan. I was hoping to be able to find a land and Orcish Bell Master it down, but that's not happening. So dismember and pass back. Uh, they are going to play out a planes, pass back to me. I'm going to try to consider they are going to stubborn denial this, seeing that I'm stuck on land. Good play by them. Pass back to them. They are now also going to be stuck on land, so they're going to be passing it back to me. I do hit a mystery rainforest, so I do have access to a land here and my black mana. Um there's an argument here to thought seizing and trying to take a Scion of Draco from them if they have one. Uh, yes, they only have three colors right now, but if they do hit their land drop, then they're able to cast a, um, a Scion of Draco, and I have no way of interacting with it once it hits the board. All of my cards are pretty garbage against the Scion of Draco here, so I think in hindsight again, maybe should have thought seized here, but it's not going to punish me as they are going to continue to miss on land drops. And in their end step, I'm just going to throw out an Orcish Bowmaster, which they are going to Lightning Bolt, um, and then pass back to me. So I've got a token, slowly chipping away at their life total, but not doing a whole hell of a lot more than that. But we'll take one one damage at a time. Dress down, very good pickup here. Uh, I am going to Thoughtseize now. And Thoughtseize is going to show me an interesting hand to have to pay attention to. So I'm most concerned about Tribal Flames. If they do hit another land and get five different land types, that's representing 10 damage over two turns. Very problematic. Obviously, the Leyline Binding is something else that I'd like to be able to uh, kind of deal with. Um, but for now, I'm much more concerned about just losing to Tribal Flames. I have ways to interact with both the Kavu and the uh, Nishiba the Brawler. So I'm going to take a Tribal Flames here and hope to be able to find some way to protect a uh, future Death Shadow from a Leyline Binding um, and not lower my life total to a point where I have to worry about that second Tribal Flames killing me. I'm going to pass back to them and Hope to be able to find ways to uh, meaningfully interact with my opponent here over the coming turns. Um, yeah, they're just going to continue to kind of get stuck, which I mean, definitely fortunate for me. I think maybe they leaned a little bit too heavily on the Ragavan in their opening hand. Um, consider, I am going to swing in, definitely going to cast the Consider to try and find a land. Um, binning the counter spell again, good card to have, given that if they're able to get out a Scion of Draco, I want to be able to counter it, but given that if that happens over the next turn, I'm just going to have a counter spell stuck in hand if I don't find my land anyway. I'd much rather dig for this land, which I find. Going to shock it in, hold up, drown the lock, fatal push, dress down. Don't want to be throwing this death shadow out as it's just going to basically get taken away by the uh, the ley line binding they have in hand. Um, the lands that they have in hand, the lands that they have on the battlefield right now happen to be exactly enough to cast the ley line binding for the two mana that they have. So can't be throwing my dash out unless I can protect it. They are starting to get closer and closer to allowing this drown the lock or having this drown the lock be actually something I can use against the Leyline Binding. But for now, just going to stay patient, chip in for one, um, see how things continue to progress. Another land, finally, kind of starting to build a mana base as they continue to fall behind. Uh, definitely getting very fortunate here. If they miss another land drop, then realistically, they're going to have to start putting cards into their graveyard and helping make this drown the lock even better. Now I'm starting to kind of flood a little bit, um, a little too many lands here off the top, but I'm not going to complain about it. I'm starting to pull away from my opponent. Continue to swing in for one and pass back to them. They are again going to miss, so they do have to put something into their graveyard, which is an Ashiba Brawler. I'm a little surprised they didn't just cast the Tribal Flames to not have to bin something, um, you know, just kind of use their mana, but it is what it is. I'm not going to complain about it. Um, back to me. And I am going to draw another land for turn. So I'm starting to flood out a bit while they continue to get stuck on land. So um, I'm definitely feeling like I'm still having a bit of the advantage, but I have to play cautiously knowing that they have a tribal flames. They've got that ley line binding. They've got what, six cards in the graveyard. So one more card in the graveyard and I'm able to protect my death shadow from that ley line binding. They finally hit their third, third land on turn number nine. So a bit of tough luck for them. They're going to go basically at full domain at this point and then throw it in a Shiba Brawler, which I'm going to be fatal pushing. And then back to me. I hit another land. It's about four lands in a row. Um, so deck's definitely not doing what it needs to to give me a little bit more relevancy to keep things going in my direction. Um, you know, what do we have? 
19 lands in the deck, so to hit four in a row off the top, definitely a little bit disappointing. Um, going to chip in for one here, throw up my Death Shadow because I do have the ability to protect it, and hopefully they're not able to hit another um, Leyline Binding, but I mean, they've got a lot of cards in hand. We'll see how it continues to play out. Just have to play aggressive to close things out here. They're at seven life, and uh, of course, at this point, I am dead to like double Tribal Flames if they hit a land and have a second Tribal Flames, so I'm happy that I did take the second tribal flames that they had in hand uh, as i technically could be dead right here had i not so very happy with that decision they are going to play out a territorial kabu which for me is great i can just remove that off the board with my dress down i'll go to my end step here fetch the underground or under city sewers um and i'm going to bin a fatal push um then i'm going to cast this dress down removing the territorial kabu and basically making it so that they have to block with the scion of draco otherwise they die I managed to draw another fatal push, so as much as I didn't want one, uh, I'm getting one anyway. Um, hopefully I can hit a removal spell here to just win the game, but I do not. So more land, uh, really flooding out at this point. But yep, yeah, swinging with both. Don't have to worry about a dash Ragavan because I do have a fatal push. Um, and send it back to them. They're now on four lands, so who knows what they could have. But uh, Leyline Binding is going to take out this uh, this shadow. Can't do anything about it. Still able to continue to chip away a bit. They're going to play a Territory Kavu. Um, hopefully they don't have a stubborn denial, but I mean, even if they did, I guess they don't even have access to blue mana here. So um, fatal push, and they do have a tribal flame still available to them. I'm essentially at three life, so I do have to be cautious. Um, great to draw on a Merc Tide here, continue to chip away. I'll send it back to my opponent after playing out an 8-8 Merc Tide, uh, and, and hopefully that's going to be enough to close out the game. Go back to my opponent, and they are going to scoop it up here. Um, so... Bit of a back and forth, kind of none of us really getting what we want. Obviously, I did get a bit of an advantage once I started to hit my land drops, but then it kind of got a bit excessive. So kind of good luck to some degree for me, but at the same time, I mean, I think I still made some good decisions to get rid of that tribal flames. Otherwise, I was just dead to double tribal flames over multiple turns. Um, yeah, go on to game two, see how that continues to play out. Quickly at sideboarding on the draw. Um, Two Preordain coming out, an Orcish Bowmaster, and two Drown the Lock. Replacement going to be the three Hibernations, which are very much specifically here for this matchup. Uh, and then two Shoulder Zedics. Shoulder Zedic being just the best removal for the matchup, especially if they get the Ley Line uh, of the Guild Pack and Sion Draco combo going. Uh, Hibernation also obviously is really good for that. Um, trimming on Preordains, I think just enough card selection in the deck. There's enough good cards for the matchup now in the deck that... I just feel like I can naturally draw into them. Don't need to be too concerned about having to filter through deeper and deeper into my deck too much. Uh, Orcish Bowmaster, a little bit medium to subpar in this matchup. I mean, yes, it can ping down a Ragavan, but on the draw, uh, just not going to be that great. Certainly don't want to see more than maybe one of these in an entire game um, post board. So trim on one of those and then drown on the lock. I'm happy to keep one in the in the deck just simply because if I do see one, you know, on turn five, six, seven type of thing. Um, it can typically have an impact, but certainly in the early games, it's it's basically just a, a dead card. So trimming on two of those. Um, opening hand here, yeah, it could potentially be thrown back, but because it's got interaction for like a turn one Ragavan, it's got interaction for maybe a turn two Scion if they go for that. Uh, definitely not going to be throwing this back, plus in a 19 land deck, having four lands in my opener and ways to continuously get lands out of my deck. I just generally feel like I'm going to be able to uh, kind of hit more or less gas from here. So feeling comfortable with this hand and going to run it. My opponent is going to lead on a Ragavan, pass it back to me. And I am going to draw a Fatal Push for turn, push this Ragavan before they're able to counterspell it and send it back to them. They are going to put out a Territorial Kavu and ship it back to me. And then I'm going to draw a Thought Seize here. So I'm going to lead on Thought Seize, get a sense of what they've got going on in their hand. And I'm going to see that they're, again, kind of stuck on two lands here. Um, they do have a pretty powerful hand, especially if they draw a third land. Um, and I kind of need to figure out how I want to play this in a way that's going to be good and that I'm not just going to get aggroed out. Um, so <clears throat> they've got the Territorial Kavu down here on the battlefield, and I want to be able to Fatal Push this without any real concern uh, for them getting value off this Ragavan. So my game plan here is to actually take the Ragavan, push the Territory of Kavu um, so that they can't stubborn denial anything, and then kind of hope they get jammed on lands and just are forced to play out either a, um, 
well, I guess in this case, they're, they're forced to have to play out the Brawler because they don't have the five land types for the Scion of Draco, right? So something to be aware of here. They need to hit that land to actually play out the Scion of Draco. Um, so I'm perfectly fine to have them just play out a Yeshiba Brawler. Obviously, they do hit that land. It's a bit tricky because they're going to have you know, Summer Denial and the Scion or an Yeshiba Brawler and Stubborn Denial. So um, there's a couple different ways you could play this. And I think both or multiple of them could be good enough, but I just really wanted to make sure that I'm not getting hit by Ragavans and I wanted to get this Territorial Kavu off the battlefield and kind of just force their deck to give them some good stuff. Otherwise, I'm going to be able to continue to control really the majority of this game. So that is what I'm going to do and pass it back to them. They have drawn a Territorial Kavu for turn, so lots of Territorial Kavus. Um, I'm going to draw an Undercity under Sewers. Uh, I'm going to fetch and just get an island here. Again, I want to be a little bit cautious of my life total. They do have many spells that can just kind of kill me out of nowhere if I get too aggressive with my life total, and I do not have a Death Shadow in my hand. I haven't seen a Death Shadow, so without knowing if I'm going to ever hit one, I don't want to be just playing too aggressively if maybe, let's say, Murktide is actually the way that I'm going to win this game. Um, Dismember is going to be used on this Territorial Kavu here. Um, they do have that Stubborn Denial that I know about, so I want to just get basically whatever I can off the board. Um, going to consider first finding a Hibernation. Very good card in the matchup. There's an argument to just, well, actually, no, there really isn't an argument because they have Stubborn Denial. I mean, maybe they overcommit to the board and they play the Nishiba Brawler, um, and I'm able to just Hibernation bounce everything back to their hand and then kind of tempo them out a bit, but I'd rather just dismember this Kavu so they're not getting triggers off of it uh, and trying to find that third land. I'm going to dismember for two life and two, and then pass back to them. Um, and so they're they're going to draw another Territorial Kavu, so just nothing but Kavus off the top. I mean, good card, but I think they're definitely looking for something a little bit more. Um, Undercity Sewers, seeing a land on top. So great spot here where Sewers is been valuable in the as a 19th land, right? Going to be able to filter away this this land that I really don't need. Uh, I'm going to Shoulders Edict the Kavu again, playing around Stubborn Denial in this case, and being able to hold up uh, Hibernation. They have finally hit their land, um, but this land doesn't actually allow them to lower the cost of what Scion of Draco is, right? So still all the same land types. Um, so they're going to actually play out the Brawler and have Stub as a backup. So perfectly fine. Um, obviously, I need to be able to find some way to uh, either deal with the Stubborn Denial or, or protect whatever spell I maybe throw out. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to be passing it back to them, letting them attack in and going to their end step to just shoulder Z edict away. Um, what I'm hoping will be this Nashiba Brawler in their end step. I'm fine to take four here uh, and then be able to maybe pass the Hibernation that's going to be able to resolve if they have another green creature or something like that. Um, so take my four, and they are going to uh, run out a Wild Nacatl. So now they have Sign of Draco, Stubborn Denial. That's what's in their hand. Uh, knowing that, I am going to Shoulders Edict here. They kind of almost certainly are going to Stubborn Denial that, and this is going to allow me to make a tempo play of bouncing everything back to their hand on my next turn. Uh, so hopefully I'm able to start drawing some threats, because at this point I'm going to basically be out of gas. Um, but I will have been able to tempo my opponent quite a bit as they are also stuck on one green here. So they're only going to be able to play one creature at a time um, unless they're able to find their, their fourth land. Uh, drawing Murktide, obviously fantastic. And again, one of the reasons why I did want to be too aggressive with my life total sticking at six life here um, to not die to a top deck Tribal Flames. So yeah, going to bounce with uh, Hibernation and then play out my Murktide as an 8-8. And just hope that I can get there off of that. So feeling pretty good about it. Two, two turn clock. Um, and they miss on land again. So I'm able to be aggressive, draw my counter spell. And uh, yeah, this game's over. So nice 2 0 against Domain. Overall, feel pretty good about it. Um, I don't want to say too much else. It's, we've got a bunch more games to go. But uh, for anyone that's having a trouble with this matchup, hopefully this could be you know, a little bit helpful in how I play it. And um, obviously, there was some good fortune here and there, but uh, also just some, some good decision making as well going to be on the draw here opening hand is definitely pretty much more or less what you want i mean would love to see maybe a threat but we can definitely dig to that later in the game um consider preordained to be able to kind of filter and find what i want sculpt my hand 
around the lock, dismember, stubborn denial, early interaction, really against pretty much every deck in the format. This is something that I'm okay with. Maybe if we're up against Tron or something like that, this would be a little bit more problematic, but um, if that's the case, so be it. Uh, so I'm going to keep this and see what my opponent's on. No companion, so no sh no real indication of what it is. Uh, flooded Strand, pass. Um, I'm going to draw Merc Tide. So I guess one thing to be aware of here, I don't want to be... Um, I don't want to just be running out this preordain and not having interaction up like a dismember or stubborn denial on their turn. So don't want to be just jumping to a preordain just because I can. Uh, much smarter to be holding up the consider and the stubborn denial or even really the dismember um, just in case they do something that really needs to be interacted with on turn number two. Uh, they're going to cycle lore and revealed, get an island, play out the island. I am going to consider in their end step after fetching and shocking and um, that consider is going to find a death shadow, which uh, I do consider binning because I don't really have. I need a land, but uh, you know, death shadow is a pretty good threat uh, of the namesake of the deck, um, and I feel like I'm I'm able to kind of get deep enough into the deck to find what I need to lower my life total to the point where death shadow is going to be relevant. Managed to hit my land drop on my draw, so that's great. Going to pass it over to my opponent, holding up drown the lock, stubborn denial, and dismember. Um, and just continue to see what they're on. I'm going to fetch and shock here. I am playing around uh, basically a main board Tishana's Tidebinder. Probably pretty unlikely, but I'd rather just be safe and play around it than lose my land drop in case they actually have it, given that they're, at the time, looking like they were kind of an is it type of deck. Um, but now all of a sudden they've got planes and forests. So I still don't know exactly what I'm up against here. They haven't done anything. Um, going to pass back to me. I hit a dress down. That's great. Uh, I'm going to preordain and try and figure out how I want to play things out. Find a Thought Seize and a Flooded Strand. Definitely want to know what's in my opponent's hand, because I do not know what I'm up against at this point. So I'm going to top both, putting the Thought Seize into hand, um, and then I'm going to just pass back to them. I don't want to just Thought Seize and leave myself susceptible to, like, counter spell, and then I have to Stubborn Denial the counter spell just to have my Thought Seize resolve, and then I'm tapped out, and they get to play, like, a Teferi or something like that, right? Which is something at least based off of their mana base, is that they could realistically have. So I'd rather just hold up Drown the Lock here and hopefully be able to interact with something or Stubborn Denial if they miss a land drop or something. If they do have Teferi, I'm much better to just kind of play a little bit patiently than get aggressive. Uh, they're going to pass back. They do miss their land drop. Uh, so again, really not sure what I'm up against and not sure what they could have in hand. So really want to get this Thought Seize out, see what I'm looking at, draw that uh, Flooded Strand that I left on top, and Thought Seize is going to resolve showing... Um, guess what looks to be kind of like a control deck with Lamplight Phoenix. So I had not seen this before. Um, this was a really cool deck, uh, and you'll get to see kind of in, in the next game what I mean by that. But basically, this is kind of just like a Jeskai-ish control, but with a combo finish. Um, yeah, I, I've, I'm always going to be a tough matchup to begin with anytime that you're in just like a straight-up blue-white realm of control as uh, Death Shadow. Prismatic Endings, Solitudes, Leyline Bindings, Supreme Verdict, like you can't overcommit your board. It's just not a super fun matchup. Uh, they've got three counter spells here. I'm going to take the Supreme Verdict because I want to be able to, of course, make sure that my creatures are able to get in if I'm able to fight through everything they have here. Um, but I also just play out my Murktide region, and this was just a miscalculation. For whatever reason, in my head, I thought that I was going to be able to Stubborn Denial the counter spell they had and have this Murktide resolve. And basically just have a Merc Tide kind of hopefully be able to cruise into victory. <laughs> but obviously that's not the case. I'm not able to Stubborn Denial because they have one extra mana up. So massive mistake on my part here. Um, again, really no idea what I was thinking at the time. So passing over to them, um, they are... Let's see, yeah, going to hit that land. And now things really just start to fall apart because now they've got a Fable of the Mirror Breaker that I cannot counter. And, and realistically, I would have known that because if they did have that land that I saw. So... They've got Counterspell, Counterspell, uh, Lamplight Phoenix, Prismatic Ending, Unknown Card, and they're going to be getting this uh, Fable of the Mirror Breaker down. So just completely throwing this game away by throwing a, a Merc Tide out here instead of just being able to hold up my Drown in the Lock. Um, just stupid, really stupid stuff. Shouldn't have done it. Um, no idea where my brain went on that one. I'm going to dismember um, and hopefully be able to get out this Death Shadow with Stubborn Denial and Drown in the Lock as backup to be able to protect it from a Prismatic Ending. And again, just continue to try to be aggressive while I can. I know they've got two counter spells in hand, so I want to just get things out and just hope they don't hit good stuff off the top to be able to interact with what I've got going on here. They're going to filter away um, a what a land and a counter spell. So they've got 
Prismatic Ending, Phoenix, one counter spell, and two unknown cards now. And I've got interaction for the first Prismatic Ending that they're going to cast here. I'm going to start with Drown the Lock because I want to be able to hold up Stubborn Denial. Um, realistically, I probably could have sequenced that the other way around just in case they had like Solitude or something like that. Um, it it kind of does make more sense to actually stub the Prismatic Ending and have Drown the Lock up for a, a Solitude. Uh, so I would reverse that if I were to do it again. They've got the Counterspell that I knew about and what I was anticipating, and Stubborn Denial that. And of course, they've got a second backup prismatic ending that they drew probably off of the two here. So um, they've got a Lamplight Phoenix and one unknown card. I have basically nothing now. And yeah, this game is not looking good. Uh, Preordain is going to bottom top, going to keep this Arkish Bowmaster. I mean, they're drawing cards, um, but I don't think Bowmaster is going to be all that great here against what they've got going on. I do want to dress down here before going to the end step because I want to basically just have dress down a cycle and filter for a card, but then B leave the battlefield. And before it comes back to my turn, I want to be able to fatal push the Kiki Diki. Uh, yeah. I mean, they've got a flyer that's going to be able to come in for three. I just accepted that if I'm not able to find removal for it, I'm dead. I mean, that Kiki J that Kiki Jiki is also just going to be able to take over the game if uh, left unchecked. So I'd rather get rid of the, uh, the, uh, Kiki Cheeky here, then take the Lamplight Phoenix. I mean, yes, I guess I could have gotten an Orcish Bowmaster down in front of the Reflection Kiki Cheeky if they decide to you know, attack in that way. Um, but I just do not want to leave myself susceptible to like Solitude plus an activation or anything plus an activation. I'd rather just get this Kiki Cheeky off the board and hope to be able to interact with the Lamplight Phoenix in a different way. Um, in this case, I draw a second dress down. So my plan now is to be able to essentially dress down um, in their, assuming they're going to attack here, obviously, uh, intending on dressing down before blocks and then being able to get my Orcish Bowmaster plus the token and the ping all on this uh, this Phoenix here. And then, you know, take it out of, out of commission and, and be able to kind of stabilize, given that they just have two cards in hand. I have two cards in hand, but uh, that's not going to be the case. They end up having a removal spell and uh, I'm going to lose my creatures. And they're going to continue to have the uh, the Phoenix. I did draw a Murktide, which is nice. Um, they're now without any cards, but they did keep. Um, did they keep on top? No, they put a Flooded Strand into the graveyard. Um, so they filtered one, which is going to end up being huge for them um, because I'm going to get this 8-8 Murktide out, but they are going to rip a Solitude right off the top. So uh, I'm going up to, what, 13 life? And <laughs> there goes any Dash Shadows that I draw. They are now without cards in hand. I essentially have two useless cards. I'm going to just hit a Flooded Strand, which is not going to be good enough. I mean, no, I'm not technically dead yet, but this game's over. There's no real reason to even talk through much of this anymore. They're going to draw two. Uh, yeah, game's over. Made quite a few mistakes here that I really shouldn't have made in the first place. Um, had I played that early Murktide turn a little bit differently, maybe things start to go my way a little bit more. But I mean, this is just going to be a tough matchup no matter how you look at it. But when you're making mistakes like that, it's just that much worse. So not a good game, not a good game at all, but we'll see how match two goes, or game number two goes. Here we are on the play, game number two, sideboarding, three fatal push coming out, and a drown the lock in favor of um, two stern scoldings for solitudes and two Tishana's tie binders, kind of also for solitude and just kind of adding some threat density into the board, or into the main, I should say. Um, I should have been bringing in Nihil Spell Bombs, but I was not aware at the time that they had a combo finish that involved their graveyard here. I kind of just assumed that the Lamplight Phoenix were more of a hard to remove threat than an actual combo piece. Hindsight probably could have seen it that way a little bit more clearly, but anyway, should have brought Nihil Spell Bombs in. Didn't end up doing that. Opening hand here, um, good enough. Thoughtseize, I mean, against kind of a, a control focused deck, want to be able to. Uh, really just get a sense of what's going on in their hand, disrupt whatever it is that they're really trying to accomplish and hopefully be able to hit some land drops here and just power through. So that's the gameplay. Um, I'm going to take a look at thought seizing and seeing what we're working with. They have kept a mountain and then a bunch of good stuff, but this Eagles of the North is what's going to allow them to get to their next land drop. Um, really kind of going all in on that. So I want to be taking the Eagles of the North they can't counterspell anything, at least not any time over the next two turns. Um, and then Prismatic, I mean, really all of their cards here rely on being able to hit a white land or you know just land in general. So 
need to be able to just try and reduce their ability to do that as much as possible and hope I can kind of get there. Obviously, they've got a lot of good stuff in their hand. I need to be cautious of that solitude. Um, they're going to play out the mountain that I knew about, uh, pass it back to me, and I am going to, um, why is this not moving forward? Um, I am going to hit a land drop. It's great. Don't have to be using my preordain to do so. Uh, pass it back to my opponent here. They are going to cycle a Lorien Revealed. So as much as I tried to keep them off of land, I could not get there. Um, they just, great top deck, wonderful for them. This game 100% could have gone a different way had they not drawn that in that exact turn. Um, I'm just going to fetch and shock. I don't really know why I would have done that. I guess I was just getting it out of the way while I could. Um, they go get one of the survey lands. They're going to put that onto the battlefield. So they now have access to both Blue and white still can't counterspell anything yet. They're going to put an altar of dementia into the graveyard, and I'm going to flash in an orcish bowmaster in their end step. Um, yeah, really feeling like this game's already getting away from me. I mean, my game plan was to just try and disrupt their mana, given the way that they kept their hand, and and they just still get there um, off a great top deck. So just going to try and pinch in as much as I can, and hopefully it's enough. Um, drawing a, a preordain. Going to fetch down and sh uh, not shock. Sorry, don't have a um, a death shadow and, and death shadow in this matchup. Really, it's just a pretty mediocre threat given how many uh, different ways they they can interact with it and just wipe it off the board. Um, really want to be able to kind of just dig deeper and try and find a thought seize to either get rid of this solitude um, or this leyline binding. I mean, the leyline binding. I can actually protect my Murktide from with the stubborn denial. So the plan is to get rid of this solitude and hopefully be able to make sure that they don't get to four lands, given that they're still. I mean, at this point, kind of stuck, at least from what I can see. Um, so uh, I don't know why I choose to top both of those. Uh, it's it's in my opinion not the right right call. Um, I should be looking for a thought seize to try and just get rid of more important or problematic cards in their hand. Um, they're going to Prismatic Ending, this Orcish Bowmaster, and while I can, I'm actually going to try and stub this just to continue to try to apply some pressure. I don't know if they have card draw in the deck or not, so I'm kind of hoping to keep it in play, just assuming that they're trying to draw deeper into their deck by removing the, uh, the Orcish Bowmaster. Turns out they actually had a land the whole time, so they're getting to the point where Supreme Verdict is a thing I now have to be cautious of, and that's part of the reason why I think digging for um, thought sees makes way more sense than keeping a land and a dress down on top. Yeah, the dress down can kind of protect me from a solitude. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Again, just kind of really misplaying this entire game here. Really, the entire first four games have been a bit up and down, some questionable decisions made. Um, drawing Death Shadow, really not great here. Um, you know, going to be able to kind of get it out um, and kind of use it as bait to hopefully just have them supreme verdict. The entire board and and then be able to try and protect a murktide region moving forward with uh drown the lock and uh dress down but you know, that's not going to end up being the way that things play out they have a one ring and of course um that is going to have to be drown at this point otherwise they're just going to get way way ahead on card advantage i mean they already have a lot of kind of just generally good stuff going on and why is this jammed what is going on here uh, there we go um yeah, so swinging in, just trying to get there. I mean, they've got a Solitude in hand. They've got a Supreme Verdict. I can't overcommit my board. Otherwise, I just lose everything. Um, they're going to go for a Prismatic Ending. Uh, I'm going to Dress Down, basically kind of hoping that I just hit a way to interact. They have a counter spell available to them, but I'm just trying to dig a little bit deeper and, and do something relevant here. Um, back to me after drawing a Preordain. They have four mana up. They have a counter spell. Um, yeah, I, I can't be committing this Murktide into anything. Just going to continue to chip away and hopefully continue to get there. We ordained to definitely at this point be trying to find a thought seize. Uh, that is something that is extremely important. So I'm um, going to hit the consider instead. Uh, again, like I, I don't, looking back at this, I don't, I don't like the decisions I'm making here. Um, I should have just, you know, continued to put things to the bottom. Um, I, keeping this turn scolding, I guess, because of the solitude and just continuing to chip in bit by bit, but uh, for me, Thought Seize is the card that I should be digging for here. Um, I'm going to end up Stern Scolding this Solitude, which is obviously good, but certainly um, kind of still feeling like I'm behind given what they have in their hand. They have a one ring counterspell. is not going to get to resolve in a way that I wanted to because, of course, they have a Veil of Summer with green mana up, so 
this game at this point is basically over. I don't see how I'm coming back from this situation. Uh, made some poor decisions again around card selection. Really should have been fighting to get deeper with thought seizes um, to disrupt their hand a little bit more and, and try and be able to get my Murktide region out and protect it. But that's not what ends up happening. Finally, do hit a thought seize. And of course, now it's too late. They've got the one ring protection. I can't even thought seize away the Supreme Verdict. Um, so yeah, just terrible, terrible. Uh, decision making. I mean, this is a brutal matchup anyway, so I'm not going to sit here and act like I could have won this game. My opponent did get fortunate in some other top decks, um, but now they've just got this lamp like Phoenix out here. Um, I'm going to go for a thought seize to just try and get rid of that supreme verdict. They've got the counter spell, um, so I kind of just have to commit to filling up the board at this point and losing everything and trying to rebuild. I mean, they're going to be able to get a lamp like Phoenix back if they wanted to, but you're going to see that that doesn't even matter. They're just going to be able to combo off here. They're going to get the Alter of Dementia out, and they're just going to start milling themselves and then eventually milling me to death. Um, I had never seen this before. Realistically, I could have just more or less conceded here on the spot, but I had no idea if I was actually dead or not. I don't know. I'm sure there's like very specific math that you have to do to make sure that you're able to mill exactly enough cards from your opponent. Um, but anyway, they're going to end up milling me out here. I don't think it's worth really sticking around and watching, so I'm just going to kind of stop this now so you guys don't have to sit here and pain through it. But uh, yeah, not an overall great match. Um, it's already a tough one, like I said, but some very bad decision-making that I think could have been done better. On the draw, this is good enough. It, it's definitely close. Um, I can naturally draw into a second land. Consider can get me a little bit deeper getting a draw anyway as I'm not on the play. Um, definitely close, but I think this is fine enough. It's got a lot of good interaction. I mean, up in denial, if they're trying to do anything non-creature on two dismembers to answer any turn one creatures or something like that. Um, yeah, for me, this is good enough. I'm going to keep it and kind of hope it goes well. My opponent's going to lead on a triome, mountain triome. So to me, that signals that this is probably going to be, um, a creativity matchup, just given, you know, apt mountain triome. Um, so I'm holding up Stubborn Denial here, expecting a Renin 6. They don't go for it, they just put another Triome out, but definitely giving me the indication that this is uh, creativity, given that this is another Mountain Triome. So I'm going to Fetch and Shock, Consider, and put a Fatal Push into my Graveyard, drawing a Preordain. Um, still not finding what I need to, so I'm going to Preordain here, and hopefully be able to find a couple of lands, which I do. Uh, unfortunately, they're both Fetch lands, so I do have to basically put both on top and then kind of just hold up interaction in the form of stubborn denial for um like uh cheeky cheeky or whatever it's called the mirror breaker uh enchantment or uh run in six if they don't hit a land instead they do hit a land but they go for fable with the mirror breaker so i do have to fetch shock and counter um luckily i do just hit a, an island off the top i'm going to thought seize and can a little too fast um thought seize shows me leyline binding uh change the equation prismatic ending Leyline Binding, Ren and Six. So obviously I take the Ren and Six here. I don't want to give them the ability to start just once they hit a fetch land, having just infinite land drops. Um, a lot of good stuff here, regardless, based off of what my hand is, right? I mean, there's a change the equation that can counter a Death Shadow. Prismatic Ending can answer a Death Shadow. Both Leyline Bindings can answer a Death Shadow. So um, really need to be ensuring that I'm playing this out as, as tight as possible and disrupting their hand as much as I possibly can. They are going to miss on a land drop, um, send it back to me. I'm going to hit a dismember, which is kind of useless. I don't want to be throwing my death shadow out as I don't have uh, enough ways to meaningfully interact without just losing the death shadow. So I mean, obviously, I could just throw it out there and have them lose a couple of spells to my spells, but I don't want to just be one for wanting back and forth in this scenario. I'd much rather try and you know find a thought seize or a different way, um, ideally like a Merc Tide, to get onto the battlefield so that way there they can't just counter it with change the equation. And then, um, you know, they have to kind of get forced to use a Leyline Binding, which I can then fight over with some counter magic. So I'm trying to find a Murktide right now, ideally, if I can, and not have to play out this Death Shadow. Um, then I'll get back to them after drawing and Consider. And I'm going to consider in their end step, Fatal Push, really don't care about it. Yeah, I mean, like, being able to, like, take off a, a token so that they can't... Indomitable uh, Creativity, or whatever the hell it's called. Um, not too worried about it. I've got a dismember. I've actually got two dismembers. So the fatal push, not not something I want. I just want to be finding that Merc Tide, like I said. Um Flooded Strand instead, and then consider is my draw. So back to my opponent. 
they are going to fetch and try and just filter the top of their deck. They do put a Teferi the Time Reveler into the graveyard. Kind of surprised at that. I guess maybe they already have another one in their hand that they intend on playing out then. Um, just a great card against me, but I, mean, I do have Counter Magic basically indicated based off of what I'm holding up. I'm uh, going to consider in their end step, they are missing land drops still, but first I'm going to under, under, under City Sewers. I can never say that right. Um, putting this Fatal Push, like the last one, into the graveyard. Uh, I think technically it's actually smarter to have considered first and then under City, under city Sewers. Um, consider allows me to, of course, just either draw the card that's on top of my deck or filter it away, then draw the next card, and then doing the sewers afterwards would allow me to filter one card deeper um, to make sure that whatever it was that was on top of my deck was going to be something I was interested in. This way, I can kind of get stuck not getting as deep as I need to into my deck. So this was a, a missed sequence, and, and it should be done the other way. Um, all right, so then, yeah, Consider Now is going to show me a Preordain, which I do want to keep. Again, it's really about just trying to kind of sculpt my hand to find what I need to to start playing around some of the crazy stuff they've got in their, their arsenal to deal with what I've got going on. So I'm going to Preordain here, um, Misty Rainforest and Murktide. So both on top, I want to draw the Misty Rainforest, ideally not having to shuffle away the Murktide if I can help it. Uh, but I do want access to, to all of my lands here just in case something crazy happens. It doesn't, so they're going to pass back to me, and they're actually going to go to discard. Uh, so Archon of Cruelty goes into the graveyard. I'm going to draw that Murktide that I knew about, and now I'm going to cast the Murktide, knowing that they cannot change the equation on it. Um, and I'm just going to try and at least fight over a little bit some of the cards that they're going to try and throw at this Murktide region. So they go for a Leyline Binding, um, which I am then going to Stubborn Denial. They are going to go for a another. Oh no, sorry. They're going to yeah, counter it with change the equation. Um, and in this case, I'm going to let it go, uh, because they binned this to ferry the time reveler. I kind of get the assumption that they probably just have one in their hand already. So they're not looking to have multiples. Uh, so I do not want to counter this change the equation. I mean, they still have access to leyline binding if they wanted it. So like this Murktide is not staying around. We could fight all day, but I'd much rather have my counter spell for, uh, a to ferry that I'm assuming they have than, than just, you know get a bunch of Leyline Bindings and stuff out of their hand. So yep, there's the Teferi I thought about. Very happy I didn't use the Counterspell. The Counterspell this Teferi now, and they continue to be stuck on four lands. So the Leyline Binding still a Prismatic Ending in hand. Um, I am just going to Orcish Bowmaster now in case they have another change the equation or something like that. Uh, yes, the Orcish Bowmaster could be used to ping down a token, um, but I'm not, I'm not going to like just sit here and wait until they continue to make tokens. I need to start playing a little bit more aggressively because my Death Shadow is not going to be the threat that it needs to be with a Leyline Binding and a Prismatic Ending in hand. Um, they do find their land. I'm just going to continue to just kind of chip in here um, bit by bit. I've got two dismembers, so I can kind of try and manage anything they do. I am going to play out this Death Shadow now with multiple forms of counter magic up. Um, so I do drown the lock and then have a counter spell, but they just have a second Prismatic Ending. Um, so. Just knowing what they have in hand, there's no reason to try and counterspell that. I have to let it go. And I, I do counterspell the Ren 6 because, again, I do not want them just getting to hit land drops over and over and over again um, if I can help it. But at this point, they still got 14 life. I just have a 1-1. One, one. Not looking super great. Um, they've got three cards in hand. I'm kind of flooding out a little bit here. I mean, we're on turn 12, so I can't say it's that hard of a flood, but really need to be drawing some better action here. Otherwise, I'm certainly going to lose. Uh, they're just shipping it back to me. They're Still stuck on five lands themselves. Uh, finding a consider. There's an argument to just considering, um, you know, right now trying to find a threat, but instead I'm going to basically just hold up consider to potentially find the interaction I need for whatever it is they may try and throw at me. Uh, I've got a Murktide and a Death Shadow. I hold on both of those things, knowing that they still have a little ley line binding in hand, likely to potentially have just another. Leyline Binding to follow it up. So I want to be able to um, take a look at either their hand by finding a Thoughtseize or at least waiting until I get a Counterspell or something like that to try and protect my creatures from uh, you know, at least one form of uh, removal that they 100% have. I you know that Leyline Binding is still in their hand. Um, do find a Thoughtseize on my next draw. So happy that I waited. And I'm going to see that they... Oh, they're going to actually reprive first. Sorry. Um, going to see that they have Creativity, Creativity... Leyline Binding, Orvid Mine, um, just a, a bunch of stuff. Uh, and so I 
yeah, I don't know. I, I, I play this bad again. I'm surprised that I'm actually in the spot that I am given how many poor decisions I've made uh, throughout this, this challenge thus far. Um, but basically I kind of overlooked that they've got a Dwarven Mine available to them so they can fetch here and then play the Dwarven Mine. They'll have two tokens. I'm at five life. My only means of interaction are dismembers. Um, so I'm going to play out my Murktide Regent and my Death Shadow knowing that they still have a uh, one ley line binding available to them. Um, so yeah, they're going to get rid of one of my creatures and then they're going to have creativity on both of their tokens and I can't do anything about it because I'm just going to have overcommitted to the board and I just don't have enough life to play with to be able to uh, to get rid of both of their tokens with what I've got going on. Um, plus one of these fetches doesn't even go get anything. Like I, I only have one more fetchable land in the deck. So uh, yeah, I'm just dead. Um, wasn't in a great spot anyway, but certainly could have played all of that better. Uh, pretty rough is what it is, but yeah, they're going to go for the creativity here. And again, I can't take out both of their their tokens. I can only take out one. So I am dead. Game number two on the play. Quick look at sideboarding, taking out three fatal push, a dismember, and a preordain. So targeted removal. Not super great here. I'd much rather have the EEs to deal with any of their tokens that they try and make and just be able to wipe those away in one fell swoop. Um yeah, there's basically no other cards that I'd want to bring in over you know, the fourth fatal push or the second dismember. So I do keep one of each in, in the actual deck just because the other options I have aren't any better. Um, I mean, you could potentially put the Nihil spell bombs into the list, just given that maybe they're running on um, persist or something like that. In this case, I, I just kind of go with they're not, and I keep some targeted removal over graveyard hate. Um, I am bringing in two Dishonest Tidebinders and a Shoulder's Edict as well as those two EEs that I talked about for just being able to wipe away all of their tokens. So that's the strategy a little bit there. The opening hand I am going to be keeping and kind of questionable, but I don't know if I'm gonna find a better six necessarily. Like I'm able to dig on my turn one to kind of sculpt my hand a bit more. I've got hopefully just enough land to really cruise through the rest of this game and get there. Orgish Bowmaster can start to at least apply a little bit of pressure if I'm not gonna do anything about it and then counter spell to, to interact in a meaningful way. So. Um, I'm good with it. It might end up being not super great, but I don't see a better six at this point. I don't want to get into a spot where I have to multi five. Uh, Preordain going to be bottoming the land, keeping the drown the lock on top. Um, you know, drown the average in this matchup, but I'm assuming it'll be something that I can hold on to into like turn four, five, and six, and it'll be something that I really want to have in my hand. So happy to keep it. I'm going to be flashing in an Orcish Bowmaster here and step going back to my turn. They've got nothing in response. So I've got myself just a nice little bow master and a token trying to do some work on their 19 life. Uh, drawing a brazen borrower, going to just swing in here first uh, just to see if they want to do something before I fetch, uh, I think, an island and then preordain to try and continue to sculpt my hand. Um, so Murktide Regent and a Misty Rainforest. The Rainforest can go to the bottom. The Murktide Regent I definitely want. So going to continue to just pass it over to my opponent here, holding up Counterspell for whatever it is they might try to do. They're going to fetch a Triome. Um, Ren and six here. So I'm going to Counterspell this with a Drown in the Lock because they do have two cards in their graveyard. So I'd much rather just use the Drown when I can. Uh, in this case, they do have the Veil of Summer, a wonderful card against Demir. Um, just always going to hit. I do get a trigger off the Orcish Bow Master, which is nice. Uh, so I do have to target myself. Uh, I can't target them. They have protection from black right now. Um, and then they're going to down tick this Renin Six on my Orcish Bow Master. So not the end of the world. They got to draw a card, but I'm going to be able to remove this Renin Six with my Orc Army token uh, and kind of just continue to be in an okay place. I'm going to keep this Orcish Bow Master on top. Uh, I do want to be able to you know, maybe just ping down a token at this point if that's the line that they want to take. I do have a dismember counter spell. Like, just feeling like I kind of have to manage their board state a little bit. Um, so happy to have an Orcish Bow Master to ping down any one one tokens they make. Continue to just play the chip game, get two in, bring them down to eleven, pass back. Um, they are going to go for a, a filter land or a, a survey land here, um, and put a red and six into the graveyard. So maybe they have one, or maybe they just don't really care about land drops at this point. They feel pretty comfortable with where they're at. Um, so I am going to <clears throat> just pass back to myself as the Orcish Bowmaster now is 100% being used to try and ping down any tokens that they have. Um, 
and then hopefully grow this orc army to a point in the next turn where it can start to be basically a game ending threat uh, if they're not careful. They are going to fetch for a token here and put out a Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Uh, I'm going to counterspell that Fable. Um, sequencing in this way, in case they do have a Veil of Summer or something like that, like in the, the day, the Fable resolving isn't the end of the world. It's certainly not ideal. Um, but I'd much rather be able to then respond to a Veil of Summer with an Orcish Bowmaster, ping down the Dwarf token, and then grow the Orc army by two, actually, because then at that point they would get to draw off the Veil of Summer. And I then have, yeah, four, I've got five damage on board. Um, so really in a, in a spot to just be able to essentially win the game unless they had something pretty crazy. So that's why the sequencing went that way. That was actually good sequencing, unlike some of the other decisions I've made in the past year. They do have a spell pierce for this petty petty theft. Not the end of the world. I do lose, of course, my brazen borrower, but petty theft, being able to bounce a token and just be straight up removal instead of an unsummon is always an opportunity I'm going to try and take. Um, yeah, so uh, Orcish Bowmaster going to try and ping down this dwarf token and start to apply the pressure, the pressure I need to just win this match. Um, going to try and get in for three, but they are going to have a leyline binding for this token. So leyline binding on a token, I'll take that all day. Um, definitely not going to complain about that. No reason to be rushing any of my creatures out with no protection. I don't want to get into a spot where if they're just able to one-for-one one me here. Um, they're one land away from potentially being able to hard cast an Archon of Cruelty, but at this point they're doing nothing. I want to just be able to hold up interaction for anything they might be trying to do. Uh, I'm going to shock in this Watery Grave, continue to chip in, give them a reason to want to fetch and try and block this Orcish Bowmaster if they want to. They're not going to now I am going to start to apply some pressure with Death Shadow. I do want to just close things out now that they've kind of shown that they don't really have anything too, too crazy that they're trying to attempt to do here. Um, they are going to go for a Dwarven Mine and then uh, go for the the Archon creation off of the Creativity, which I do just have um, a Dismember for. Uh, in this case, again, being very cautious to manage my life total appropriately. I don't want to be too aggressive with my life total loss if i went down to six maybe their last two cards in hand are bold bold and i've just killed myself by being way too aggressive with my life loss um got shoulders edict available to me there's no reason to just not use my mana efficiently while also managing my life total so uh something to be aware of there team three on the draw no change to sideboard they haven't shown me that they have persist um so i'm not going to just lean in putting graveyard hate into the deck if i don't feel fully confident that it's something that they're trying to do uh, there are versions of creativity, even if they have black, that are not on persist. So um, at least I think there is. Either way, I'm good with not bringing the uh, the Nihil spell bombs in, given they haven't shown me a reason to do so. Um, very happy with its opening hand. Thoughtseize will allow me to get a sense of how I have to play things, hopefully disrupt them in a meaningful way. And then if I'm lucky, I can get a Death Shadow out, uh, punch in for some damage, and then sneak in with Dress Down for the win. Um, so of course, want to be able to find maybe like a Counterspell or something like that to be able to protect my death shadow and of course there it is right off the top i'm really happy with that i'm going to lead on of course the thought seeds to get a sense of what's going on no veil of summer which is great um they've got creativity two mirror breakers and then a bunch of land uh definitely just want to take the non-redundant cards so i've got counterspell for one of those fables hopefully i can maybe hit a counterspell again for the second one uh just do not want to be leaving them with creativity available to them they are going to rip a ren and six off the top a little bit annoying um but whatever so <clears throat> back to them they're going to go for their creativity here or their excuse me their uh, mirror breaker which i will be able to hey, no they don't sorry they do not go for the mirror breaker uh they are just going to fetch in a tab land and pass it back to me I'm going to put this orcish bowmaster out and uh ping down myself trying to lower my life total or my death shadows at this point i haven't seen anything that's going to be threatening my death shadow i want to get it out of bolt range so i do ping myself to be able to do so in this turn uh, so going to swing in at my opponent. I don't really care about this Ren and Six at this point. I just want to get my opponent's life total as close to 13 as possible in case I'm able to sneak this Death Shadow across for the win. Um, like next turn, if they don't really have anything um, and they just let me go for an attack, I can dress down, basically putting them down to one, and then they're stuck not being able to, to fetch anything moving forward. Um, they're going to go for the... Fable of the Mirror Breaker here, which I am going to try and counterspell, but they do have a spell pierce for that. So unfortunate that that is the case. Um, so that's going to get to resolve. They get a token, and I'm kind of falling a bit behind now. 
just have a dress down available to me. I'm going to top that children's edict and the raise and borrower. Bit of an argument to maybe having taken the children's edict first and then just children's edict away to Ren and Six so they no longer have access to it. But I mean, they've got their land drops. I know they do. Um, I kind of want to just maybe try and interact as much as I can with their tokens to get them off the battlefield whenever possible. Uh, and 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 then yeah, again, just kind of sneak through for a, an Alpha Strike with Dress Down and a thirteen thirteen Shadow if they're going to let it happen. Um, they do of course filter lands off of this Fable, and then they're going to get in for two, which I'm not going to block. Um, going to make a token, a treasure token, make another Orvin Mine slash token Orf token, uh, and then they're going to go for the other Fable of the Mirror Breaker, which I knew about. Can't do anything about that. And then they do have Prismatic Ending, which I'm sure they filtered for with some of the card draw off the first Fable. So that Spell Pier is coming in pretty clutch for them there, I think. Um, able to ping down my token, I mean, at this point, things are looking pretty damn bleak. Uh, I'm going to try and petty theft away one token so I can at least clear their board a little bit. i um, going to filter away the um, Shouldered Edict that I had left on top at this point. Shouldered Edict doesn't really feel like it's going to be enough to get there. I really feel like I need another threat or something like that. Uh, ideally, a Merc Tide that's going to allow me to fly over. Unfortunately, that's not what I hit. So Undercity Sewers going to keep that preordain on top because I do need to just get deeper into the deck and preordain is going to be a good draw to do that. Um, dress down here to try and get deeper, but uh, yeah, no, I, I do end up finding a Death Shadow, which at least it's going to be a blocker. I'm at six life. They bolt me. And at this point, I'm dead to whatever is on my opponent's side of the field. They've got Ren and Six to ping me down. Um, and I mean, I can make a block, but it doesn't even matter because they've got creativity. So uh, super dead. And always a tough matchup, creativity, like if you're not properly prepared for it, it can be a rough go for Demir Shadow. Of course, with sideboarding and adding different cards that target it a little bit more heavily, uh, you can you can definitely have better odds against it. But overall, it's a, it's a tough matchup, and I feel like I played some of it well, some of it not so well. Um, so now 3-2, basically need to win out here to get myself into the top eight. So feeling a bit of pressure, see how it goes. It's already pretty late into the evening at this point, I should mention. I don't think I started with this. You know, I took this on at nine o'clock at night, um, and this entire challenge ends up going into like four thirty in the morning for me on a Sunday. So I had work in the morning. I decided to power through, just trying to put up a good result for um, you know the Demir Shadow lovers out there, and just put something into the meta that maybe people aren't anticipating or aren't expecting to be good enough to do what I did. Um, but yeah, I, my my brain was definitely a little bit. Uh, in sleepy mode towards this back half of the tournament. So something else to be aware of. Here we are for match number six, um, opening hand on the draw. Not good, just really no way to ensure that I'm able to try and hopefully hit that second land drop. Of course, he's got some threats, but just not good enough. So gonna ship it back, I'm looking for a better six. Opponent is mulliging as well, they're down to six. This is a better hand. Um, thoughts these to get a sense of what's going on over there, ways to dig deeper into my deck. Go get that watery grave that I intend on putting back into my deck here with the mulligan and then drown the lock, hopefully, to be able to interact as well in a meaningful way, depending on the matchup. Um, so this is going to be an exciting one. Um, my opponent is going to be on Yogmoth here. Uh, so leading on a forest and ignoble hierarch. So that definitely to me almost 100% signifies Yogmoth in the current meta. I don't know what else that could really be. I mean, maybe Jund way back in the day, but uh, no, I, I don't think uh, this is something that even Jund would want to be on. So I'm going to lead on a thought seize because I definitely want to be interacting with their hand as much as possible as soon as possible. Uh, going to get a sense of what's going on over there. They've got four hands or four cards in hand. Um, and thought seize is going to show me Order of Calling, Delighted Halfling, Wall of Roots, and a land. So um, taking Wall of Roots here is the best decision. Wall of Roots, if they are able to cast it, allows them to double spell while also still attacking me for one if they really wanted to. Um, so I want to kind of keep them off. As many creatures as possible and reducing their ability to double spell as much as possible as well so if i can basically make it so that this court of calling is essentially not something they can even do um, or at least make it so that it's extremely extremely weak maybe just a one mana creature i'm going to do everything i can to make that happen so wall of roots is the take here and leave them with a delighted halfling that they can cast next turn that i'll be able to drown with my drown in the lock i definitely don't want that uh, delighted halfling sticking around long term they're going to get in for one damage, perfectly fine by me. They're going to play the Verdant Catacombs that I know about, so I'll just close some of this out so you guys are seeing what's going on from a hand perspective. 
um, going to, yeah, just fetch shock, drown this delayed halfling. I want to be lowering my life total to get this shadow nice and big. Uh, I do have to be somewhat cautious of being too aggressive again. They do have ways of just swinging in with hasty to one um, strangle root geist. So something to be aware of. Don't want to be so aggressive that I just accidentally put myself dead to that. Uh, they are going to have a Yawgmoth here. So Court of Calling is the only thing they have in hand. Unfortunately, my Drowned Lock right now doesn't quite hit this Yawgmoth as they've only got three cards in hand, or three cards in the graveyard. But luckily, I am going to top deck a Thought Seize, which is a massive draw. This allows me to not only get this Court of Calling out of their hand, but also uh, Drown the Lock, the Yawgmoth, leaving them with just a Ignoble Hierarch. So uh, very happy with that draw. Extremely timely, very fortunate. Um, so far, again, very tight play, allowing for all of this to happen. So getting a little bit rewarded for that. Uh, yeah, super happy with it. They're going to actually draw a card, getting rid of the Noble Hierarch. So one unknown card left in hand at this point. And I've got a, a Shadow and a Preordain. So I'm feeling pretty good, unless they go like Runner Runner and just have nothing but gas from here. And I'm pretty confident that I can get this game turned around. They do have an Hepatra plus a card. Uh, they're stuck on three lands right now still. So probably like a four drop. Maybe it's a Yawgmoth. I don't know for sure. Not aggressed, so I'm happy with that. Uh, I am going to... Preordain here, looking for a way to either potentially thought seize whatever is in hand, assuming it's another Yawgmoth, um, or I want to be able to just interact meaningfully with my opponent. I'm going to bottom the Odawara as much as you know, maybe growing out my land base is important. I'd much rather operate on these three lands that I have and continue to just hit gas so that I can interact meaningfully. So I'm going to hold up Orcish Bowmaster, hoping that my opponent is going to uh, basically swing into me and I can just ping down the uh hepatra and then block with one token leaving myself with a bow master they are going to put out a delighted halfling not the end of the world certainly problematic for counter spells against like grist and yagmoth again the fact that they have one card in hand and haven't cast it um to me represents that it's probably a yagmoth i mean it might be a court of calling or something like that uh but more than likely they have another yagmoth in hand i'm going to consider instead of bow master at this point because uh i just want to try and find ways to deal with what's going on here that delighted halfling cannot get pinged down by my bowmaster at this point I very much want to get it off the board i do find this fatal push which is going to do exactly that a patra by itself is not really a concerning threat to me at this point um draw preordain so as much as there is the decision here that i could preordain trying to find something um and just kind of pay a little bit more patiently i do want to get this death shadow out right now I feel like my opponent is holding on to uh, a Yawgmoth. That's that's my sense. So unless they hit a Grist directly off the top, um, then uh, I should be in the clear. And realistically, even if they do hit Grist, like they're going to have to get rid of the Hapatra down tick to get rid of my Shadow, and then I can just Bowmaster down the the one loyalty Grist, um, and then have you know a Bowmaster and a token plus my preordained to kind of keep chugging along. So I'm fine with that. Um, really just forcing my opponent to have a really good draw based off of the read that I'm going off of, given their current play pattern. Um, they do they do hit a Grist here, or they've been holding on to it. I, I would be very impressed as to why they'd be holding on to it, as they do have three mana. So I'm assuming they just top deck this. So good on them. But they're not going to down tick here. They're actually going to up tick, which is just fine by me. So I can ping down the token, and now it kind of forces a Hepatra block, otherwise you're going to lose the Grist. Uh, or if I hit some kind of removal, then I'm very much in control of this game. So um, I am going to hit a Summer Denial. Really not a great card in the matchup, but I mean, obviously it can hit a couple of things, and my Death Shadow does make it ferocious. So um, not a phenomenal pickup, but it could definitely be relevant. Preordain is going to find a Dismember in a Watery Grave. Absolutely want to Dismember um, the Watery Grave at this point. Growing out my mana base is not super needed i just need to continue to hit really good um interaction to make sure i can clear this game out uh, so going to dismember for two life and two um another thing to take note of here they currently only have three mana one card in hand so i can go down to four life and it's full swing without any concern for um losing to a strangle root geist or excuse me two strangle root geist because they can't have land strangle root geist strangle root geist so I'm able to be aggressive here, lower my life total down to four, um, and swing in entirely, getting rid of this uh, this Gris while also taking two points of damage to my opponent's face. Um, so yeah, very happy with that. And they are going to run out of land here. They finally hit their fourth land and play out a Yawgmoth. So 
that means that I'm assuming my read was 100% right from a couple of turns ago. They had a Yawgmoth stranded in hand, and that's why they weren't casting anything uh, when they were stuck on three life, and they did top deck that um, that Grist when uh, when they needed it, but able to get it off the board, and they are stuck with just a Yawgmoth. Um, in this case, I'm going to draw. Consider I am going to consider to see if I can hit some removal. If I can just get rid of this Yawgmoth. I'd love to, but at the same time, counter spell is something I'm more than happy to see. So I'm just going to swing in for nine with my uh, my Death Shadow here. They're definitely not going to block it, and I get to hold back my Orcish Bowmaster, my Orc Army, and I've got counter spell. So unless they have something really good, I think I'm feeling like I can win this one. Uh, they're going to shoot up this. I guess it's all called Soul Cauldron. Summer Denial actually hits that, and they decide to concede, pack it up. So uh, great win. Yep, I think a very tough matchup. So having to play super tight, see the lines, get a sense of what my opponent is trying to do. I think I did exactly that through and through, especially considering how some of my gameplay or some of the lines I took in previous matches looked. Um, very happy with one of the hardest matches for the deck being played so tight. So good one there. We'll see how the next one goes. Here we are for game number two. I think sideboarding for this matchup in particular is one that I get a lot of questions about. Um, Deviating a slight amount here, no, not really, but kind of a deviation in terms of how I adapted for this particular game, just given that I'm on the draw. Um, the cards I want coming in, first and foremost, Nihil Spellbomb to fight over the graveyard. Both of them come in, Stern Scolding to be able to fight on the stack over like um, Yawgmoths or Grists or uh, really any of their creatures. Pretty much all of them are going to get hit by this, so long as they're not made uncountrable by um, the Halflings. So want to be having your all of your one-man interaction targeted removal as much as possible because those halflings have to get off the board. They can just wreak havoc on the overall game plan of holding up counter spells and having to interact on the stack when you can't actually make meaningful interactions because those things are uncounterable. Um, and then I also want Shoulder Zedict. I mean, Shoulder Zedict can get rid of a Grist. It can get rid of all of their creatures, uh, depending on how big of a board they build up, of course. Mostly there for Grist, though. Uh, so definitely want that. And the last one is Tishana's Tidebinder. Tishana's Tidebinder pretty much exclusively going to be used for Grists and Soul Cauldrons. They can be used, of course, on their um, Yawgmoths, but it's very rare in Freakum where that happens just because they can activate Yawgmoth in response to that, kill the Tidebinder, and it doesn't really serve a massive purpose. So so long as the board is clear of Yawgmoths and you're just trying to fight over some other like, grindier cards, uh, Tishana Tidebinder is extremely versatile. So I'm taking out two Dressdowns. While Dressdown can, of course, turn off some of the stuff they do for a turn, doesn't really stop them from comboing off uh, you know, a turn later. It doesn't do a whole lot. It's hard to get an alpha strike in where you're swinging with a 13-13 um, shadow through whatever it is they have, right? Their blockers. Hibernation, again, I mean, yes, they have a lot of green creatures. They do have a good balance of black ones as well. I just don't think Hibernation is a good enough card in this matchup to be bringing in. Uh, I am cutting on Stubborn Denial. It really only hits their um, Court of Callings and their Soul Cauldrons, just extremely narrow. I'd much rather have just hard counters and uh, drown in the locks, if possible. Preordain, uh, as I mentioned before, any time that I'm looking to cut whenever I've kind of felt confident that the amount of cards that I have in the deck are all going to be good, uh, I cut on card selection. So Preordain, just given that it's sorcery speed, I'd much rather have consider any time I'm playing against a Bowmaster deck, having the ability to kind of force the Bowmaster through uh, and be able to react to that instead of have to be reactive to it. Um, or I guess, sorry, that's the same thing to, to, to kind of force through, um, you know, a preordain and then kind of get got by their bowmaster. Basically, is what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, it's a scenario I don't want to put myself in, so I'd much rather work at instant speed. Um, and then yeah, trimming on one drown the lock just because I am fighting over graveyards with the Nihil spell bombs. If I do exile an entire graveyard, I don't want to get into a scenario where I draw a drown the lock or have a drown the lock in my hand. And that has now become completely useless. Uh, so trimming on one, certainly still a scenario that can happen, but I want to reduce that opportunity as much as possible. So that's the sideboarding. Uh, hand here, opening hand on the draw. I'm fine with this. It has a thought seize to be able to fight over whatever they keep as their opener. Um, you know, if they mulligan, it's even better. If they don't, I still am able to build a game plan. I've got to consider to try and find a second land if I don't hit it off my draw. So I'm happy with this. It's got a lot of good stuff, um, so long as I can really fight over the stack properly and build a good game plan. I'm going to keep it, see how my opponent plays it. Um, they are going to basically just put out a young wolf here, pass back to me, uh, and then I'm going to thought seize them, um, fetch and shock, of course. And I'm going to be taking a look at kind of a, a decent hand, no question about it. Um, it. It's got potential, more so reactive on their part, though. 
so I'm not too worried about Fatal Push or Legion's End. I've got a Murktide, so I can kind of just throw this Death Shadow out to die if I really want to and just kind of know that that's going to happen. So I'm, I'm trying to lean into Murktide at this point and make sure that I both get it on the battlefield and can protect it. Um, Apatra is really the only card that I want to be getting rid of. I can counterspell this Court of Calling. I can try and make sure that their battlefield stays generally uh, sparse enough to the point where Court of Calling isn't really a card they can cast effectively. And even if they can, I can just counter it. So that's the game plan, and we'll see how it plays out from there. Uh, I will bring this up just so we can continue to monitor that. All right, so then they are going to play out a Pendlehaven. Uh, so swing in and add uh, one point of damage to that. So they've drawn that per turn. Their hand is still ex uh, fully known. Um, I am going to hit a, a land drop here, which is great. Sometimes you just have to trust that the land is going to come off the top of the deck. Happy to be at 19 right now uh, in the overall 60. So going to play that out, shock it in, and pass it back to my opponent, holding up interaction. Um, I'm not overly concerned again with what's going on here. Technically, they can put out a uh, Besaju and Court of Calling for one. I can interact to it with it if, if they want to. Uh, in this case, they decide to swing in. Um, so they're not going to Besaju. I'm going to consider, and this consider is going to find me a Nihil Spellbomb, which is something that I'm definitely looking to keep. I want to be able to have the graveyard in check if possible. Uh, currently, Court of Calling, not something I'm overly concerned with still at this point. We want to have the ability to keep interaction up. So Hitting a land here, being able to put the spell bomb into play and then hold up interaction is fantastic. Um, drowning the young wolf and then being able to exile it um, is something that I definitely am keeping top of mind here. They are going to kind of, I think, in this instance, I don't know, they just commit to it. Uh, I think there's a point in time here where they get a little bit tempted to hold back and maybe go for a court of calling, but for now they're just applying pressure. I mean, I'm at seven life, I get it. Um, still nothing else. So oh, this post AG is gone. So they've got three known cards, two unknown cards. Uh, still not overly concerned. Drawing a second Night Hills Ball, a Spell Bomb. Not great. Uh, I mean, yeah, I would have happily taken a land there or something, but not going to complain about a, a Night Hills Spell Bomb. I mean, it can definitely be used at a later turn. Uh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I guess they just tapped for no reason. They can't court a calling um, for zero, uh, unless I guess technically I think they can, right? If they have a uh, uh, Dryad Arbor. Uh, but doesn't seem like that was the play they wanted to go with anyway, so fine by me. Uh, in this case, this is when they finally commit to not actually attacking, so they're clearly going for a Court of Calling. And in this case, I'm fine if they want a Court of Calling for one. Uh, I'm happy to get this Young Wolf off the board, exile it so it doesn't come back, and draw a card off of everything. Um, if they want a Court of Calling for like a, a Halfling, probably, it's not really going to be the end of the world. I do have a Counterspell in hand, but I definitely have ways of finding a uh, a way to interact with that uh, delighted halfling, or just kind of forcing my opponent's hand a little bit and just starting to apply some pressure with my uh, my death shadow and kind of force them to have to use some of the removal and kind of get into this big attrition match. So I'm fine to do this, get that off the board, and start using my mana effectively. Same thing goes with the fact that this drown the lock. The longer that the game goes on, and the more I have to get tempted to activate the spell bomb, the more that I'm just making that drown the lock worse the longer the game goes. So Better to just be a little bit more proactive there, use my mana. At least I feel like that's the case. I can see how some people would disagree with that approach. But uh, yeah, hitting my lands at this point, I've got all my shocks. I'm going to put out this Death Shadow, shocking it in, even though I know that, of course, they have uh, access to both Legions and, and Fatal Push here to try and get rid of my Shadow. But at this point, I do feel a little bit better about trying to fight over stuff, especially Fatal Pushes and Legion Ends. They don't have the ability to cast both unless they hit a land drop, so I can just hard counter a Fatal Push if they went for it. Uh, and that would allow me to at least get some swings in with my Death Shadow that's pretty chunky at this point. They just do nothing. Uh, this Court of Calling is gone. So four unknown cards. Um, they choose to do nothing here. So again, maybe it's a Court of Calling. I don't really know. Maybe they've got Bowmaster. I'm not really sure what they're working with at this point. Just kind of holding up Fatal Push. Not sure. Uh, drawing Bowmaster for turn, uh, definitely going to take that, especially because I'm at 5 life now, so I do need to be a little bit more cautious of making sure that I have blockers so I can start to get aggressive here with my Death Shadow and force a Fatal Push. Um, oh, in this case, it's actually going to be an Orcish Bowmaster, not a Fatal Push, so holding onto that push for something else. So I do take an interesting line here. They are going to ping me down to 4, and um, I I overlooked that there's a Pendlehaven untapped. Uh, I was thinking I could just ping down this Orcish Bowmaster and it wouldn't be a problem, uh, but of course they're going to protect it. And 
I'm going to use my Tishana Sidebinder in a way that I really wasn't hoping to have to use it for, because as I said at the start of this game, I prefer to use it for cauldrons and for grists, but I do have access to just fetching an island and using the tide binder on the trigger. So that way there, they're not going to get their token. Kind of feels like they're forced to block to some degree. Um, they don't have to, of course, right? But I'm going to have two blockers to protect myself. Otherwise, they're getting attacked for nine and it's starting to apply a decent amount of pressure. So it does feel like they kind of just have to throw this bowmaster away and I'm able to build out a little bit more of a, uh, a battlefield, uh, a board state where I can at least protect my life total a bit more. I'm fine to lose this death shadow. I mean, it was something that I never really felt like was going to get me there in the first place. My objective right now is to get this Merktite down, have Counterspell available to me, and make sure that things go my way from here. So we're going to get a Yawgmoth down. That's fine. Not the end of the world. I have an Eye Hill Spell Bomb. Kind of flooding out now, but I mean, an untapped land that doesn't make me have to lose life. I'll take it. It's not the end of the world. Not going to be able to attack here. Going to get this Night Hill Spell Bomb out and cast a Murktide region. So just basically hoping that they don't have a uh, a Grist that I'm not going to be able to counter. Um, I do have the ability to exile their graveyard if something weird starts to happen and they go try to go off with uh, Yawgmoth. They hit another land. So three cards in hand. Um, one of them is still a Legion's End. So two unknown cards. Clearly at this point, they're going for a Court of Calling, which I am able to counter spell, which is very fortunate. Uh, and then back to me. So they're tapped out. I'm able to get in for a nice big swing here coming up. I'm going to hold this Nihil Spell Bomb as it can represent growing my Murktide. It obviously is mainly to used uh, against their graveyard, but in a pinch or if something weird happens, uh, it can always exile my own graveyard and grow my, my Murktide regent if ever that opportunity presents. Uh, I'm at four life, so something else to be aware of is the fact that they've got three uh, total power on board right now. So I am dead to like a Stranglerook Geist. Um, uh, they can't pump either of these creatures with Pendlehaven because they are basically just kind of stuck. I feel like I needed to take this attack to be able to get to a point where I can swing in with my Murktide Regent, exile my own graveyard to grow the Murktide to a 7-7, which puts them exactly dead. I'm not dead on board. Of course, they have outs. They also have the ability to potentially find an Orcish Bowmaster. But I just feel like I have to take my spot here. I've just been getting fed lands at this point, which isn't great. Um, so just got to assume that they're not going to get to uh, an out that can kill me and hopefully be able to attack him with this Murktide region. They are going to go with Legion's End to clear off my Murktide, or my um, Orcish Bowmaster, and then they have Agatha Soul Cauldron. So we're in a bit of a, a stalemate here. Um, I don't want to activate the Spell Bomb yet because I want to make sure that they can't grow either one of these creatures, right? So if they basically exile their Orcish Bowmaster, then I'm dead. So I need to be able to respond to that, and I think they obviously know that, right? Otherwise, they'd just be swinging in here and trying to go for the win. So if I exile in response, nothing happens. They're basically just dead on the crackback, so they have to hold back. Um, now I have the ability to exile my own graveyard and grow my Murktide to lethal. Um, another land, so not great. Um, my opponent knew about that land from the Legion's End. They were able to see my hand. So I'm going to swing in for six, representing essentially lethal again because of this uh, exiling my own graveyard move here. They are going to draw a card and uh, put themselves still dead to the exact same play, even though I get a minus one, minus one counter. I am now going to exile my own graveyard uh, just because the only thing that can get them in out here basically is if they have an Orcish Bowmaster in hand, they would be able to, yeah, well, actually, no, nothing. The Orcish Bowmaster actually doesn't get, get them there, I don't think, right? Um, they're still going to die to activating the Yawgmoth multiple times to shrink my Murktide. So at this point, they don't really have, I think, any outs that are going to get them there. So yeah, they take the five and this game is over, uh, or six, is it? Um, yeah, beating Yawgmoth, always a, a great feeling. It's a tough matchup across the board. Again, flooded out a little bit there towards the end. So the fact that the deck was still able to get there, fantastic. I think like a lot of times when you're winning more difficult matches, there's some good fortune that comes your way in the sense that they never hit a Grist. They didn't hit something that was going to make it uncounterable during the time that they had a, a Delighted Halfling on the field and I had a Counterspell. So I was able to actually counter just the Core of Calling instead of um, one of their legendary permanents. Uh, but at the end of the day, still a lot of general good decision-making. Like, that's the mistake with the Orcish Bowmaster and the ping and 
having to use my uh, Tashana's Tide Binder in the way that I did wasn't ideal, not the way that I wanted to approach that one, but I just overlooked it. And uh, I was at this point starting to get quite tired. So uh, yeah, still a good game, but uh, some minor, minor missteps here and there. Here we are for the win and in match, uh, match number seven. So opponent has mulled down, or well, we will have mulligan down to uh, five. I'm on the play. So definitely want to be keeping this hand regardless of the fact that my opponent has mulled. I didn't do that when I made this decision. Um, you know, thought sees on turn one with the ability to preordain to find some land, some actions. And as we've seen on a few instances in this entire challenge, uh, it's, it's very possible to just draw land off the top, of course. So trusting that the deck is going to be able to get you to a second land and just have a bunch of good stuff to be able to get you moving in the right direction after that is, is the way that I approach most of my keeps and, and uh, mulligans. So Thought sees my opponents on five cards, so this is going to be great. Really get a sense of what we're up against and how I have to play and really kind of put my opponent behind with only four cards. Orcish Bowmaster, one ring, clearly up against um, what I have to assume is some version of Coffers. No other deck really looks like this. So not worried about the one ring. I mean, if I can find a land and get to a point where I'm able to counter that, I'm just not too worried. It's far enough down the line that I should be able to interact with it. I mean, I've got an Orcish Bowmaster. If they do end up resolving it, I can at least apply enough pressure to the point where they really need to find something off of this one ring in a couple of draws or I'm just going to run away with the Orcish Bowmaster. So I want to remove their Bowmaster and basically just try and make sure they don't resolve much of anything at this point. Um, they, of course, have Sunken Citadel available to them, plus two uh, Demolition, well, a Demolition Field and a Field of Ruins. So Got to be very cautious about how I approach my fetching and when to go get dual land or, uh, yeah, well, shock lands um, and when not to. So uh, they are going to just put in this sunken citadel, pass it back to me. And I am going to preordain trying to find a second land here. Lucky for me, I'm going to hit two different lands. I actually put the watery grave on top and then draw the misty rainforest. Um, I think that's wrong. Right, because if I keep the watery grave, I'm guaranteed to hit my. Well, no, I guess the reason that I did this is definitely because they had access to either field and ruin or demolition field, so they have the ability to shuffle away the top of my deck anyway. Uh, so I'm just going to put this shuffle land uh, on top to be able to draw it, and then keep the other land as my next draw, depending on what they do. Just assuming that they're going to try and blow up some of my lands here, because it is a strong play. Uh, instead, they go for a Dothy Voidwalker. Um, I don't think I get really punished for my decision. I mean, yes, if I had put the Watery Grave on top, I could just be fatal pushing this Dothy Voidwalker now. But at the end of the day, I just get to not crack my fetch, draw my Watery Grave, and I'm able to just fatal push this Dothy Voidwalker while still being able to grow my graveyard for this Murktide region. Um, I do cast this Murktide region while I've got the opportunity. I know their hand is essentially exactly these three cards so unless they rip the perfect uh removal for this murktide region i should be able to protect it long term and hopefully just get the win here so i'm gonna fetch shock and make a 6-6 for murktide region my opponent is basically just going to field of ruin me i'm gonna go get an island they've got two swamps so one unknown card in hand it's clearly not the removal they need for this murktide region so that's great counter spell is an excellent pickup given that i'm now able to actually after that one ring, instead of not being able to do to drown the lock, not hitting enough cards or having enough cards in the graveyard to be a counter spell for that. So very timely, good draw. I mean, any time that you're winning this many matches, uh, usually you got to have a little or a lot of good fortune sometimes. Uh, in this case, definitely a very good top deck for me to be able to respond to this and continue to just apply pressure. So back to me. Um, I've got this Orcish Bowmaster that I'm just going to be holding up, managed to draw another land. So hopefully to continue to get deeper into the deck. They do have an, um, an Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth out, so I don't want to be cracking this fetch whenever possible. This is just basically a mana-producing land at any time that they can destroy your mana base. You want to reduce the fetching as much as you can until you absolutely need it, uh, especially in this matchup. It can just be the, the difference between winning and losing. So they have two unknown cards in hand. Uh, turns out one of them is a cling to dust, so they're going to actually cling one of my cards. That grows my Murktide, so... Just a little bit surprised to see that. I mean, it makes it make a little bit more sense, I guess, to drink one of theirs, but I guess they're intending to to um, escape this cling to dust as well. So that's probably the reason they're not doing it. Anyway, I'm not opposed to it. I'm not sure why they chose the counter spell. They probably should have just 
taken the land here, but again, no complaints for me. I am going to flash this Orcish Bowmaster in. This allows me to get an extra ping. And uh, yeah, I mean, there is at this point pretty much nothing they can have that's going to win them this game. Um, I can counter a damnation. I think there's been some people playing that weird uh, version of damnation that's a five drop. I forget what it's called now. That can exile their own graveyard and then do a damnation effect and then also happen to like surgically extract something if you remove a certain amount of cards from your graveyard, uh, whatever it's called, that new mechanic, I can't remember. Anyway, point being, uh, they just don't get there and they're dead. So pretty good. They obviously had a, a rough go of it, given that I thought C's on the play and they had two cards that were relevant and I, I managed to draw a timely counter spell. So all good. Let's move on to game number two. Up a game against Coffers, Mono Black Coffers. Uh, typically a more difficult matchup for a lot of the Mirror Shadow players. So not always going to be easy. Feel pretty good about what this opening hand is. We'll get into that right after sideboarding. So basically taking out all of my targeted removals, dismembers, fatal pushes, all gone. Uh, bringing in Tishana Sidebinders. Just want to be able to shut down activated abilities. Um, Shoulder Zedix, at least those hit pretty much all of the relevant things they could be doing. I mean, they typically have Planeswalkers. They've got uh, a couple larger creatures. So want to be bringing in the Tishana, or excuse me, the uh, Shoulder Zedix over any of my other removal, ideally. And then Stern Scolding is able to answer their Orcish Bowmasters more often than not, which can eventually kind of just become problematic, especially if they get a bunch of them going. Um, sometimes they could be on grief, sometimes they aren't. I'm not really sure what this person exactly is on, so I'm not going to go into it assuming they have grief in the deck. Uh, it's likely that they probably do, but I, I just personally don't play that way if someone hasn't shown me that, and they did it in the last game, that I'm not going to like potentially hinder the ability for my deck to do what it needs to do to win, just because I'm making assumptions around what they have, especially when a grief scam type of package is typically going to be something that someone pushes uh, to do whenever they have it. So I didn't see it last game. I'm not going to assume they have it this game. Um, yeah, this opening hand, immediately able to impact their hand so long as I don't get thought seized, Stern Schooling to answer an Orcish Bowmaster, potentially Drown the Lock, Merc Tide, like just the nice equal balance of interaction and threat density that I'm looking for. Uh, so definitely keeping this. They're going to be on a mulligan again. Uh, down to six, not five this time. They do have to put in a tap land for black. Uh, so I'm not really sure what they're keeping, given that they just got nothing going on here. But most of their spells are a little bit later in the game anyway that have big impact. So maybe they just kept a lot of you know, three, four, five drops. Um, Thoughtseize is going to show me that turns out they are actually on the scam package. And they just didn't quite have the opportunity to do it here, given that this is a tap land for the fact that they have no swamps. Um, so I'm going to take Grief, so long as I don't get Thought Seeds bugged, if you want to call it that. Uh, I should be just fine. You know, obviously, Unlicensed Hearse is going to be a bit problematic for my Murktide region in time, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to figure out a way to interact with the Unlicensed Hearse and eventually get my Murktide region out. If I can't, well, so be it, but I definitely can't be getting Grief scammed uh, with this current hand. I'm just screwed. Obviously, there was the potential to just hold up Stern Scolding here and really get far ahead because... They would just be stranded with kind of what they have here unless of course they played the unlicensed first next turn but like i said at the start i did not go into this assuming they had the grief package maybe i should have um anyway i'm going to take the grief and hope that i'm able to fight through everything moving forward uh they are just going to play out the unlicensed first pass back to me so you know, my game plan right now is to try and make sure that that unlicensed first really only grabs one card at a time i don't want it growing too big in case it's able to start swinging in serious damage yeah they're just gonna exile my graveyard that's fine by me um then they are going to play out a swamp so demolition field they're gonna blow up one of my lands uh all of my fetchable lands off of de demolition field or uh field of ruin effects are now gone so i really have to make sure that i'm playing as much as i can around that when i can um obviously you can't always do that but it's still something that you need to be very aware of if you're playing against coffers um Okay, so drawing a Stubborn Denial here, uh, I want to be putting out my fetch land. I don't want to, again, be milling things into my graveyard and giving that unlicensed hearse a little bit of extra food if I can help it. So just let them force them to have to take one card at a time. And then maybe I can build myself into a spot where I can get this Murktide region out if I just string together a bunch of spells and fetch lands simultaneously to be able to actually get a Murktide region out and then be able to protect it. They're stuck on three lands. They have a not dead after all, a fatal push still in hand. Fetch land, another good draw. Don't have to mill anything un unknowingly or on, on purpose into the graveyard if I don't have to. Keep this unlicensed hearse. 
uh, a little bit lower than than maybe it could have been had I played it a little bit differently. Uh, they are going to continue to miss on lands, so three unknown cards in hand now. Uh, I'm not going to fetch. I don't want to be, again, throwing my graveyard yet. I want to really do it all together at one time if I can. Vishana Sidebinder, a phenomenal pickup now. Now I can interact with this unlicensed hearse and find a way to be able to uh, string a couple things together, get them to activate the hearse, and then hopefully protect the Dishana Sidebinder or not have it come off the battlefield if I can help it. Consider is going to go to the top. Definitely want that to kind of try and, like I said, grow a big graveyard or a big enough graveyard successively in one turn to get out of Murktide region. So definitely want to have that. They do hit their land, so still three unknown cards. So not that after all, it's probably not doing much for a while unless they hit a grief uh, or just protecting any future creatures they try and play. Fatal push is the thing I'm most concerned about right now. So I'm going to hold up everything and then go for a consider in their end step here. Um, and then they are going to respond to that consider with a um, with a, an Orcish Bowmaster which I am able to Stern Scolding. Um, so, so far, everything playing out exactly the way I want it. Uh, and in this case, I do want to be able to fetch here, again, kind of trying to protect my graveyard as much as possible from that activation. Uh, and then I'm going to flip the land into the grave, or excuse me, on top of my deck, uh, and they're going to go for an activation. I then respond with the Tishana's Tide Binder. And we're kind of off to the races. They can't Fatal Push it here um, because they don't have Revolt. So, that is on the battlefield. This is shut down until they're able to find a way to remove Tidebinder if they even can. Shoulder's Edict, uh, another, a second one. I'll take it. No no complaints there. Um, able to fetch Shock, throw uh, a Merc Tide Regent to uh, a 5 5. So not exceptional, but it's now on the battlefield. Able to take my time, be patient, and get around this um, unlicensed hearse that I left in my opponent's hand. Deshaun's Tidebinder getting in for three. Uh, they are going to send out a. Um, uh, Shouldered. Shouldered is going to definitely get a Shouldered's Edict, surprisingly enough. Always funny when that happens. Uh, yeah, gonna let them resolve. I'm not dead after all. That's perfectly fine by me. I will just Shouldered's Edict away the Shouldered after it has come back. Uh, so Shouldered's gone. They can't fatal push anything because they had to tap out to do all of that. So still in command here. Uh, unfortunately, it's still a three turn clock as of, as of right now, at least. So, uh, Still ways that I can lose this game, but I've got multiple forms of interaction. Uh, the Drown the Lock kind of feels like it should be able to hit pretty much anything they throw at me at this point. Um, certainly they can get some big spells going, maybe a, a really big march of the... What's the the Black March? I forget what it's called. Um, that would be maybe the only thing that I'd have to be concerned about from a Drown perspective, but I've got Summer Denial turned on, so don't have to worry about that. They're going to go for a Liliana of the Veil, which is going to get stubbed. So I can hold up Drown and Lock um, and swing in here for just shy of lethal. I'm um, going to be at one life and just kind of force them to have to have something or they're dead. I do have Drown the Lock. They just don't have it. So there is an argument, like I said, maybe to having Drowned the Liliana and keeping a stub just to be 100% certain one of the weird larger spells that maybe gets around Drown the Lock doesn't get to resolve. So that is something that I could have potentially done a little bit better, but I didn't really get punished for it. It's the equal reason to maybe just hold down the lock for you know, Orcish Bowmaster or something like that. So uh, there's a balance. It can go either way. And uh, yeah, things worked out in my favor. So winning in, we are off to the top eight. And I do finish eighth. So a bit of a disadvantage from here. All of my matches have to be on the draw. So hopefully I can play tight. Obviously I did because I get the win, but um, definitely stressful when you're I think at this point it was like three o'clock, maybe three thirty in the morning. So just trying to power through and get it done. Uh, very tired at this point, but very happy to be making the top eight on the draw. First match of the top eight, um, playing against the top seed. I looked all of my general opponents up, or at least the people that are currently in the top eight, to get a sense of you know, what people typically are on. Uh, in this case, this person is typically on scam. So I went into this hand thinking that that's what they were probably leaning into. Um, on the draw, I mean, this is definitely better on the play. Definitely a keep on the play, but on the draw, uh, I don't really want to be mulliganing. You know, I still have some pretty good interaction. If they don't scam me, they lead on turn one Ragavan. So long as I don't lose my Orcish Bowmaster, I should be able to at least keep up a bit. So I'm happy to keep this and just hope that you know, they don't have too crazy of a hand. Uh, my opponent is going to lead on a Ragavan, pass it over to me. I'm going to go with a Watery Grave. I want to be able to keep my, uh, any of my fetches for being able to crack um, and have a revolted fatal push for any scammed um, any scammed griefs. 
I am going to be binning a flooded strand um, off of a consider on my own turn. I just really want to try and control the top of my deck. I mean, I can't really control it, but I want to make sure that if there is a good card somewhere in those top two, I want to be able to get them into my hand and not over to this Ragavan. They are going to get in before two here um, and dial a Misty Rainforest off the top. Happily take that, given that I've got four lands or three lands in my hand at this point. Um, over to me, I'm going to now play out that Polluted Delta, intend on cracking that for an island and then Bowmastering down this Ragavan when they go in for an attack. They are going to put a card on top of their library, so whatever it is they like. Swimming in, Bowmaster comes out. I'm going to pin down this. Uh, oh no, sorry. They get a Thought Seeks off the top of my deck first. Um, okay, getting carried away here. Um, they take it to Thought Seeks off the top of my deck. Of course, that's the way that Ragavan just always goes more often than not. It just hits the most relevant card they could find. Um, so they go for that Thought Seeks. I'm going to respond with the Orcish Bowmaster ping down the Ragavan, and then they're going to cast this Shouldred. Um, obviously very problematic for me at this point. really need to find some interaction. They do take a Brazen Borrower that was in my hand, so can't bounce the uh, Shouldred back anytime soon. Really problematic here. Uh, I do play out the Flooded Strand, and Thoughtseize seem not dead after all in Grief. I'm going to take the not dead after all. I can counter the Grief. Definitely want to make sure that my opponent, if I can, as much as possible, keep them from being able to uh, resurrect this shoulder with a not dead after all. So really want to make sure that doesn't happen. I'm going to block with your Army token here and just really hope I can find some action. Uh, surprisingly, don't play out a land here first. I know they have a land in hand. Actually, they've got two still in hand at this point. Um, so very confused as to why they just lean into this. But I'm going to definitely stubborn denial while I've got the chance. And uh, yeah, that's that's going to go to the bin. They're going to uh, put out this Bloodstained Mire and pass back to me. Uh, I'm going to shock in a Watery Grave, just hold this Bowmaster back as a blocker, have Counterspell up for Grief, have a Dress down in case I need it. They're going to gain some life. Um, I'm going to fetch a Swamp and go for, um, oh, I guess going to crack this word in first, go for another Swamp, go for the Grief, and I'm going to counter that. They are going to swing in, and I am going to be blocking that, of course. Definitely can't be taken out, otherwise I'm dead. Uh, have a dress down here in the end step to just kind of filter and try and make sure I don't take a trigger from the shouldered. Running a Murktide region is pretty rough. Um, it's going to have to come down as a 3 3, even though I could get it out as like an 8 8. Uh, and then, of course, the shadow is a backup. It's really nice, but I'm still pretty far behind here. Them finding a Dothy Void Walker really spells trouble. Um, and I'm going to fetch underwater sewers or under city sewers in a Orcish Bowmaster and just not have what it takes to get there. So they are going to take game number one on the play. I mean, can't be too mad about that. It is what it is against Scam. Game number two going to be on the play here. Uh, sideboarding real quick. Thought sees one of them coming out, taking out a Preordain, two counter spells, two Dress Down. Uh, so Dress Down, just not a good card in this matchup. It can actually just give them free griefs if they really want them, uh, depending on how you play it. Um, doesn't really do a whole lot. I mean, yeah, I can turn off a shoulder for a turn or something like that, or you can maybe try and sneak in for you know, one big strike with a, a Death Shadow, but it's so infrequent that that happens that I really don't want Dress Down in this matchup. Counter Spell, two of them coming out. It's very rare that you get a lot of opportunity to really interact on the stack in a meaningful way. Meaningful way. Um, I'd much rather have targeted removal or at least ways to deal with things once they've hit the battlefield, especially if I end up getting my hand torn apart by a Grief. Um, the two counter spells come out. Thought Seize as a trim. Um, definitely want to have Thought Seize if I can in the opening hand, like they do here. But having too many of them, especially in a very heavily attrition based matchup where your opponent might not even have hands and or cards in their hand by the time they get to turn number four, um, certainly don't want to overindulge on Thought Seize. So Thought Seize gets taken out, and then one preordain. Again, like I've kind of talked about consistently, any time that I feel like the deck has generally what it needs to to succeed from a uh, card standpoint from the cards that I bring in from my sideboard is typically preordained that I look to cut, or at least a combination of preordained and considers. Um, so that's the decision making there in terms of what comes in. Uh, I'm going to be taking two shoulders edicts, just want more removal for the board. Um, Stern Scolding answers a lot of their cards, pretty much just all of their creatures, actually. Um, and then Nihil Spellbomb, both of those come in. Just want to be able to interact over the graveyard if I can. It's not the best kind of graveyard interaction card for this matchup, but it's what I have in this case, and happy to bring it in to try and at least have some kind of impact. It can be cycled if it really needs to, if they're not really scamming anything. Um, so that's the plan. 
opening hand here. Definitely good. Thought seems to be able to deal with whatever garbage they're trying to do on turn one. Hopefully not scamming me, but even if they do, I mean, I've got a pretty stacked hand here. So happy to keep this and see how it plays out. Uh, going to go to a thought sees here. My opponent has kept seven, so they're happy with what they have. I do see basically the things that I've got covered across the board is that Docky Boy Walker really want to be able to interact with these Fable the Mirror Breakers as much as possible to make sure they can't filter through any of the crap cards that they end up um, maybe drawing. Uh, these Fatal Pushes really aren't going to be super meaningful, given that I've got a Merktide region that I intend on riding to victory if I can. So taking the Fables, going to be able to get these Void or this Void Walker off, uh, off the battlefield if it resolves. Not really concerned about it. So over to my opponent. They are just going to play out the Arch Flats that I knew about, pass back to me. Um, I am going to end up drawing a counter spell. Definitely great, can hold on to that. Um, they are going to fetch and keep a card on top of their library, so they like that. They're going to play out this Takanuma, pass back to me. So for me, given the fact that I know they've got a Dothy Voidwalker in hand, kind of signals that they probably have an Orcish Bowmaster, so I'm just going to hold on this Bowmaster for now and hopefully be able to draw a Thoughtseize, which I do, um, but need to be able to get this second land going to really make it work the way that I need to. So pass back to my opponent. Hopefully they try and go for something here that I can just counterspell in the stack and then kind of get something out a little bit more safely. They do find a Blood Crypt, so um going to be able to cast Fable of the Mirror Breaker soon enough. Uh, I do kind of feel like I need to start seeing my mana a bit here and applying some pressure. If they do have an Orcish Bow, Orcus Bow Master, it's not the end of the world. Uh, I've got interaction. It's not going to be that quick of a clock. I don't have any real card draw going on right now. So if they do have an Orcish Bow Master, which they do, um, it, it's really not the end of the world. I'd much rather force their action a little bit and start to have the ability to interact more meaningfully over the couple of turns coming. Thoughtsies off of uh, a watery grave that I've drawn here is going to, oops, excuse me, help Fatal Push first and foremost, and then actually hold up Counter Spell as the play, swing into this Orc Army token. Happy to trade it. Uh, I don't want it to grow any bigger if they do have another Bowmaster that they're able to draw. So they've got a Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Fatal Push, Fatal Push, Dot the Void Walker, and an unknown card. They are going to go for a Fable of the Mirror Breaker, so that's the one that I knew about. Um, I am, of course, going to be countering that. And then back to me. They have missed on land here, so Thoughtseize, I guess I should pause. Um, yeah, Thoughtseize is going to basically show me that their hand is now Dothy Voidwalker, Dothy Voidwalker, Fatal Push, Fatal Push, and I take a third Fable of Mirror Breaker. So just trying to keep them from being able to kind of get an extreme amount of value off of Fable of the Mirror Breakers here. And I do have answers to both of their Dothy Voidwalkers, so happy to take that. Get a 7-7 seven, seven Mark Titan play and kind of just see how this is going to play out. Can hope I can ride it to victory here. Um, yeah, Dothy Voidwalker comes out. Back to me. Find a land, not super great. Uh, don't want to be interacting with this Voidwalker now, just given if they do have a not dead after all or any type of kind of resurrection type of card. Um, it will be problematic, so want to interact when it's on the battlefield attacking me. In this case, they do have it, so Happy that I saved it. They're going to cast this other Dothy Void Walker pass back to me. I'm going to fetch sewers in a land, hopefully be able to find something better off the top. Orcish Bowmaster, definitely fine. I mean, they basically just need to have interaction for this Merktide right here, or they are going to be dead. In this case, I do want to dismember the one with the um, the token on it so that I'm not losing too much life here, and they're not able to, again, bring it back from their graveyard. Uh, Liana is going to try and take out this Merktide region, but Luckily, the Orcish Bowmaster that I have in hand, able to both ping down a Liliana and make sure that I just sacrifice an Orc token. Um, you know, I could have pinged their face technically, given that they have a um, the, the ability from from my kind of exile here to dismember or try and dismember um, this Merktide region to shrink it. So uh, that would actually kind of only have me swinging in for three next turn, given that I am going to be sacrificing this orc army, but I really wanted to make sure that, uh, well, no, in reality, it actually made the most sense to actually ping their face here and not get this Lily off the board, given that they're just dead no matter what to the crackback. So a uh, bit of a miscue on my part there, but it doesn't really end up punishing me at all. In number three, um, on the draw, this hand's garbage, sideboarding, no changes whatsoever. It's always going to be the same whether it's on the play or on the draw. 
Um, yeah, no lands can't keep this. Unfortunately, I have the mulligan against scam, not where I want to be. So hopefully I'm not getting scammed. Throwing it back and um, this is definitely better. I'm uh, going to be putting back the Orcish Bowmaster as I don't need those, or at least don't need two of them. It's a little bit redundant. Um, so still hoping I don't get scammed, but certainly a good keepable hand on six for the matchup. Uh, my opponent is just going to play out of Verdant Catacombs and pass back to me. So probably the best case scenario with the current hand that I have, I am going to hold up Stern Scolding uh, in case they do try to scam me on this next coming turn. I do not want to just be thought seizing and completely having this game get away from me because you know, they just have a bunch of redundant cards that are not really able to impact in a meaningful way by just removing one of those cards. So holding up Stern Scolding, assuming that I'm going to be able to interact with whatever my opponent might try to do. In this case, they are going to go for a scam grief, which you can dot the void walker. So stern scolding, I'm sure that doesn't resolve. Opponent is just going to pass it back to me with another backup plan. <clears throat> uh, I am going to run under city sewers and play out an island. I'm going to thought seize to get a sense of what my opponent is doing. If they do have um, an orcish bowmaster, in that case, I kind of want to hold off on this preordain and then be able to bowmaster down their bowmaster next turn. But what I do see is instead of Fable with a Mirror Breaker, not dead after all, and then a bunch of not much. So uh, I'm going to be taking this Fable, leaving them with basically pop deck mode at this point. So very happy to see that. Going to actually preordain. I got carried away there, but going to preordain and bottoming both of the two cards that I had there. Basically just need to be able to kind of find some counter spells for the Murktide region that I have. Um, I do draw a second Murktide regent uh, off of those two bottoms. So if they do happen to thought seize me, I guess that's good, but I certainly didn't end up putting that into my hand. Uh, the two cards that I bought them are actually two lands, so um, you know, it's not terrible, but not exactly what I was looking for by any means. I'm um, going to play on under city sewers, filter the top of my deck here. In this case, it's Airdane. I definitely want to be keeping that. I want to be dig deeper into my deck, depending on what my opponent is able to interact with, unable to get a Murktide region down this turn at all. So just happy to kind of try and be able to grow a Murktide region effectively while also making sure I'm getting the right interaction for what my opponent is trying to do. I'm going to lead on a preordain. If they've got an Orcish Bowmaster, I want to be able to Bowmaster it down with my own Bowmaster. A preordain is going to show me Thought Seize and Consider. Definitely want to be seeing both of those cards. Thought Seize will allow me to get a sense of what my opponent is doing, and then I can throw out a Murktide Regent if the coast is clear. In this case, it definitely is. I'm a little surprised they didn't try and Thought Seize me last turn, um, but it is what it is. So just going to take their... Uh, on seats that I can kind of make sure that for the rest of the game the path is clear 100%. If I want to kind of cast a second Merc Tide over a couple of turns, I want to be able to do so. So I'm going to get this Merc Tide out and really just hope that they don't top deck absolute gas. They play out a Polluted Delta, which was not in their hand last turn, so they drew that. Sitter is going to bin a Flooded Strand, drown the lock off the top. So have a way to protect my Murktide Regent. At this point, it feels like this game's pretty much locked up. They're going to double fetch, just making it even easier with this Orcish Bone Master in hand. Uh, Drown in the Lock is going to protect this Murktide Regent, and they are dead. I mean, I can grow the Murktide Regent through casting a second Murktide Regent if I wanted to, but I mean, I'm just going to ask Orcish Bone Master hold up Counterspell, even though it's completely unnecessary. So off to the semifinals. Here we are for the semifinals. This hand is definitely a keep on the play. I'm actually a little surprised. I didn't think that there were die rolls top eights. I thought it just went off of placement. So a little confused while I'm getting the play here. Maybe that just doesn't happen online, but um, nonetheless, getting the play, so that's always good fortune. Uh, thought seized, deal with whatever it is my opponent's doing on turn one, Bowmaster, on some Regavans or weird uh, stubborn denial for any potential relevant non-creature interaction. And then of course, Merc Tide kind of just blows out the game and Hold up, stop it, right? I'm using on something else. So, very good seven cards here. Very happy to see it. Um, gonna lean on a thought season to see what I'm up against. Pretty tough matchup again. It's quite a few tough matchups over the last little bit here. Uh, thought season shows me creativity for a second time tonight. And they don't have a tremendous amount going on. Definitely gonna be taking the creativity out of their hand and force them to try and draw another one. Not too concerned about a lightning bolt, fabled mirror breaker. I can hopefully just. Stubborn Denial if they just go for it on turn three, so I'm um, not really too concerned with what I'm working against here. I'm going to send it back to my opponent to see what they do. They are just going to play out the Scalding Tarn that I knew about, pass back to me. Thought Seize. Thought Seize again. The 
table of the mirror that I table of the mirror breaker that I knew about. Um, in this case, I just want to be able to kind of get rid of what I want out of their hand. Uh, technically, yes, I could have just stubborn denial this fable if they go for it in turns from now, but I'd rather just get rid of it, have the stubborn denial for something else more meaningful, um, and really just kind of leave my opponent in a top deck mode. Of course, this is a deck that does top deck generally very well, so kind of just trying to race and play my hand out as efficiently as possible, holding up stubborn denial for a future run in six if they do draw it here. Um, in this case, they don't. They're just going to play out the Bloodstained Mire that was in their hand, put a, a calling turn from the top of their library into their graveyard, pass it back to me. Uh, I am going to decide that I need to play aggressively here. If I fetch and go get an Undercity Sewers, I can put a fifth card into the graveyard to be able to cast this Murktide region or two. Uh, obviously, if it's a non-land, non-creature card, super beneficial. If it is, you know, kind of sucks a little bit, but I'm still able to get out a 5-5 Murktide region. So to me, it feels like it's the best play right here. Um, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Top of my deck is going to be an Ottawara. So ends up being a 5-5 Murktide region. I do have Stubborn Nile still available to me once that resolves and I get to untap. So hopefully they just don't hit anything too crazy off the top of their deck moving forward, but they can't go for the combo yet. It's only their turn three. They're going to keep whatever is on top of their deck there. For their next turn, I'm going to draw a Drown the Lock and hope to try and ride this Murktide region to the finish. Um, pass it back to them, holding up Orcish Bowmaster's Stubborn Denial. They have a Dwarven Mine, and I am going to put a ping down this token. They are going to bolt my Murktide region, which I go to let resolve the second bolt. It's going to be trying to get Stubborn Denial, but they have a Mana Tithe. Um, so I guess good for them. I really wasn't expecting that. Uh, had I known they had Mana Tithe in their deck, I certainly would have played that differently, but no chance I was expecting mana tight in this matchup. So I lose the Murktide, but I still have Orcish Bowmaster to try and get there. They are going to make a dwarven or excuse me, make a dwarf token, which I am going to then ping down and they are going to scoop before it actually happens. Yeah. Just stuck on a land in a hand and I guess they felt like they weren't getting there. So very happy to take game one and on to game two. Number two on the draw, quick look at sideboarding, taking out basically all of the targeted removal. So Fatal Pushes all four dismembers both uh, bringing in a, two engineer explosives. My removal of choice really wants to just be wiping away as many tokens that they have. Um, so engineer explosives, phenomenal in the matchup. Uh, and then I want to be bringing in shoulder edict. I mean, it can deal with their red and sixes. And if for whatever reason I'm able to survive, it should an Archon of Cruelty hit, um, it is going to be generally the best removal for that as well. And Tishana's Tide Binder is kind of just an additional clock if ever it gets to kind of a top deck mode, I want to be able to just close something out or just turn off some type of trigger. Maybe they go for a fetch to make a dwarf token. Being able to make that not happen can always be much more useful than targeted removal more often than not. So that is the game plan there. This opening hand is just not good enough to mark down regions. Um, while I do have pot seeds, if I get stuck on one land, there's no chance to them this game. So I'm going to put it back, looking for a better six. And I do feel like this is a better six. I'm going to put this dress down back to the bottom. Hope that I can either just get some lands off the top or kind of filter the top of my deck with preordains into exactly what I'm going to need. My opponent's going to lead on a sacred boundary. I am going to play this drawn flooded strand, hold up stubborn denial against hopefully a random six. They do not have that. Uh, in this case, I am going to preordain with a stubborn denial up again. Uh, they do not have any cards in their graveyard, so no point trying to hold up drown the lock, assuming that there's just nothing going to be able to be drowned. Would much rather get the top of my deck uh, exactly how I want it and kind of preordain if they go for um, a Fable of the Mirror Breaker, I'm still able to stubborn denial it if it's a run in six. I wasn't going to be able to drown it anyway, so just being man efficient and trying to set up for next turns. Consider and um, Counterspell on the top, definitely want to see both of those. I'm going to put the Consider so that I draw it and I'm able to cast it in there and stuff, but if they don't go for anything, they are just going to put a tap land into play to pass us. I am going to consider in my end step, draw this counter spell that I knew was already there. I'm going to shock in a watery grave. And at this point, I will hold up both stubborn denial and drown the lock just in case my opponent goes for some weird stuff. I want to have multiple forms of interaction. Um, they're just going to play out a bloodstained mire, pass back to me. I draw for a uh, misty rainforest, pass back to them. I do play the engineered explosives here, which I think is actually the wrong decision because they're going to go for an. Uh, prismatic ending, which I am going to fight over. They end up having a Veil of Summer, which I then have to counterspell. 
they have the mana tithe. Uh, so um, probably just not the right move. Uh, I kind of felt like, given that I didn't have interaction for any tokens, I kind of wanted to just have it out there. But given that I've kind of thrown away most of my most relevant cards to fight over it, uh, probably not the right play. So preordained land, Murktide region. I'm going to try and get this Murktide region out and hope that Stubborn Denial is able to protect it enough so that I can just cruise in for the win. I mean, they're at 13 life. It's Murktide, so it's a two-turn clock. Um, but they are going to have multiple Leyline Bindings here, and I am going to lose this Murktide Regent and kind of just be in top deck mode with Atawara to at least try and protect myself a little bit, but um, it's it's really not going to be much. My opponent, I don't know if they can turn those into Archons or not. I'm assuming they must be able to, and that's why he wanted it onto the battlefield, or they wanted it onto the battlefield. Um, I'm going to draw a tap land to play it out. Things are really looking good at this point. They're going to make a token. At least I'm able to bounce it should they go for something. Um, but certainly not looking good. Gonna attack in, pass back to me here. Drawing dress down, certainly not great. It will be a filter card, or at least able to handle an Archon trigger if they go for an Archon. They do keep whatever is on top of their deck for their next turn, so that could be problematic. I am going to bounce that token back to their hand. I don't want to take too much damage. They do have bolts and stuff, so putting myself dead to like bolt, bolt, bolt or something like that. Um, something I want to avoid as much as possible. Yeah, how unlikely it might be. They are going to fetch for a token here and then hard cast an Archon of Cruelty. Going to dress down uh, at least it turns off their trigger. I was thinking about dress downing again to try and find a counter spell, but instead I keep it for their attack trigger. Um, Murktide region, unfortunately, is just going to be a little too small to block this Archon of Cruelty and trade with it. It's going to be a 5-5. Um, Thought Seize found a Get Lost and a uh, Lightning Bolt in my opponent's hand, so I take the Get Lost, trying to at least protect myself for another turn. But uh, in this case, is it's just going to be all a little too late. Or too late. Um, so, on to game number three, looking at an opening hand of absolute garbage, no lands, can't get this. Definitely not excited about the fact that I'm having to go down to six, but it is what it is. Sideboarding just before we get into the rest of the game here. Uh, no changes whatsoever, so everything stays the same. Um, going down to six, definitely a better six. Not super stoked about it, but it has the ability to interact on the play um, and hopefully get this Murktide region out with the ability to protect it through finding something with Preordain. Uh, going to put the water, or excuse me, the flooded strand onto the bottom of my deck, um, and then not seize my opponent to get a sense of how I need to play these next couple of turns off of this watery grave. So, um, not seize shows me. They do not have white mana. They've got some problematic cards, no question about it. Um, but this Ren and Six isn't coming down for at least two turns, if not three turns, given that this Dwarven Mine um, is probably going to come down tapped. They're going to probably hold up uh, Bale of Summer off of the stopping, stopping Ground. So unless they draw a fetch land or just an untapped land in general, they really don't have a great hand here. Um, I mean, yes, they have a good hand for later turns, but early on, I have the ability to, to really kind of take control of the game and filter my hand as effectively as possible to get this Merc tied through. Um, of course, the fact that I can take this Leyline Binding, which is what I'm going to take, is, is definitely key here. I'm not concerned about much else going on. So taking the Leyline Binding, sending it back to them, and they are going to just hold up this stomping ground, basically showing me Veil of Summer. Uh, I am going to preordain to get a sense of what's coming off the top here and hopefully find what I need to consider Drown the Lock. Uh, I am going to top the consider bottom the drown. It's probably aren't going to get their graveyard going too much too quickly for me to care about it. I really just want to be able to kind of get to a point where I can grow um, my graveyard as quickly as possible and then find something like a stubborn denial to protect my Murktide. They are then going to put in a tapped door in mind like I expected, given that they haven't found a land. Consider I am going to bin the Thoughtseize so that I'm able to grow this Murktide region. I do hit a Polluted Delta as uh, the card that I draw. I'm going to fetch for an Undercity Sewers, just trying to kind of and filter the top of my deck while also hopefully growing a Murtide region. Orcish Bowmaster on the top. That is a card that I would like to see so I can interact with any tokens. I mean, I do have an Engineered Explosives, but if I can just ping down a token and use the Engineered Explosives in the future, that is definitely top notch. I'm going to get this Murtide region out while I know I kind of have the path clear in general um, and pass it back to them. They are going to Veil of Summer, just kind of cycling for a card. Uh, 
go to themselves. So they now have a Lightning Bolt, Prismatic Ending, Ren and Six, and four unknown cards. They do play their Ren and Six. They take it up on nothing, pass it back to me. I'm going to just swing in at them, draw the Orcish Bowmaster I knew about. They finally hit a white mana source. I am going to use Shoulders Edict away this Ren and Six before it's able to do anything. Um, and then kind of go to my own turn here after I lose this Merktide Regent. Luckily, I do have some map tokens off of that to be able to filter with this Orcish Bowmaster. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. Going to cast the Bowmaster. It's going to get lightning bolted before it uh, its trigger resolves, and then off of the trigger, I am going to explore with the token, putting a or you know, keeping a, a consider on top of my deck and growing the or um, orc army token. They are then going to prismatic ending that army token in their own turn and just continue to have two lands. Uh, I am going to keep this orcish Bowmaster on top, uh, and in this case. Some people might be asking why I'm playing at the Murktide region and not putting out, you know, holding up um, EE or Orgish Bowmaster to interact with any tokens they go for. They don't have um, three mountains here. Their, their planes is not going to allow them to fetch for the ability to get a Dwarven Mine and create a token simultaneously. So I do have the path clear to kind of try and put some pressure onto my opponent again um, and know that next turn I can hold up what I need to. They are going to keep whatever is on top of their deck there, uh, and then play out this Leyline Binding, which is of course going to remove my Murktide region, drawing a shadow. Not super great. Uh, I'm going to play out the EE now that things can get a little bit tricky. I'm going to cast this Orcish Bowmaster because I do want to be able to activate this map token again to kind of filter the top of my deck when possible. Attack in first, try and get in for two, but they are going to Leyline Binding the Orcish Bowmaster. Perfectly fine by me. I'd much rather have that go than my Engineered Explosives at this point. Um, still getting in for one, going to draw an island off of this uh, map token, get a little bit deeper into the deck, they are going to cycle, and then Prismatic Ending my token, fine by me. I'd much rather keep my Drown the Locks for any of their most relevant smells. Um, Preordain is going to be top-bottom, um, so I want to keep it to Shauna's Tidebinder, the other card that I saw there, which unfortunately went a little too quick, uh, was the Children's Edict. Um, it's just not good enough in this current stage of the game, so I'm going to put that to the bottom and look for something more impactful over time. Uh, I could be flashing in this to Shauna's Tidebinder in their end step, but there's no reason to do that. I want the Tide Binder to be able to at least hit something, some type of triggered ability. Um, Thoughtseize is going to show me that they have Mana Tithe, Oust, Prismatic Ending. The thing I'm most concerned about is this Oust, because it's the only thing that they can really use to interact with my Murktide region. Um, Prismatic Ending obviously can deal with my Shadow here, but I feel like the Regent is going to be the way that I win this game, so I want to be able to remove any blockers that might exist there from my opponent's side. Feeling pretty good about where I'm at with this kind of hand of four versus their two. Gonna send it back to my opponent, just holding up Drown the Lock into Shine a Sidebinder, as long as as well as having this engineered explosives available to me. Um, they consider doing something, but then you know, just send it back to me. Uh Flooded Strand, not too bad here. Going to fetch and shock now to be able to get myself to a point where this Death Shadow is out of bolt range. Of course, they do have the ability to prismatic ending it, but um I'm willing to fight over that depending on what they do. Uh, prismatic ending is going to get drowned, and then they do nothing else. They are going to fetch off of an Arid Mesa, and the one unknown card in hand is the Fairy, so they bounce the Death Shadow. Again, still generally okay by me at this point. I still have the EE here to be able to blow up any of their tokens. Fortunate to draw a second Death Shadow. I'm going to play both out and really kind of get my opponent to a point where if they don't have the answer here, they're just 100% dead. Um, you know, they've just got a Mana Tide Stranded at hand. Turns out their other card was now a Cycle the Veil of Summer and they are going to hang it up after not being able to draw whatever it is they need to finish this game. So that is it. That is all. Uh, technically, there should be a final game for the win, but uh, my opponent and I decided to split in the finals as it was like 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, and none of us wanted to be, be there at that point. So um, he was kind enough to, to let me win. Um, and I mean, I had already beaten him in the very first uh, match of the entire tournament. So was feeling pretty good about where I was. Tron, when I'm prepared for, is a matchup that I really like. Anyway, um, yeah, great win for Demir Shadow. Very happy with that. Obviously ecstatic to be able to, you know, both do it, but also bring the content to you guys and give you guys something that's going to be hopefully very useful for continuing to get better with the deck. Um, as someone who's put all of their time and effort into really making this a deck that I specialize in and, and where I spend all of my time when it comes to magic, it's, it's awesome to get a win for you know, both myself, but also for the community and kind of show people that you can 
kind of win with anything out there in, in today's modern metagame. Um, so looking forward to, to getting this out here and hearing your feedback regarding kind of some plays that I made or any lines that you might have done differently.